Good evening, dear students. Welcome to the session. This is the second part of uh, anatomy class, which we are, uh, you know, preparing you students towards an ICT exam in the month of May 2023-2023. Yesterday, I had some queries. So, some of the students they were asking, uh, is it equally good for FMGE? FMGE the requirements are a bit low so I will not recommend FMGE people to actually attend the class but you can attend the class if you wish to have some you know high level content for FMGE we conduct separate classes number two uh, students were asking what are you wearing here on your hand this is basically for palm rejection when you are writing on a touch screen I want just my pen to be registered on the screen, not the palm. Otherwise, uh, you know, there is a blurring of the skin, a screen. So that is why I bear this. So let us continue with the discussion. And uh, good evening. Harshal, Sukhinraj, Mayur Kumar. And another query was, is it a recorded session or live session? When we write it as live session, it will be a live session. This is a live session. Though most of the time what happens is I am so busy engrossed in my teaching that I am unable to look into the chat. And if your queries are there, rarely I'll be looking at that. Uh, only after the session, post session, I go through that, those chat messages. But anyway, I'll try to interact like yesterday uh, there were some questions which I was asking I was looking whether you could answer them properly or not and obviously uh, because you are preparing for INI seat exam the standard is going to be very high though the highest standard is uh, all India PG the INI CT standard is a bit low in terms of asking questions but you need to work quite extensively and hard uh, when it comes in hard and smart work you have you need speed with accuracy basically so good evening yes Kantempudi, Parheen, Kalasai, Kalai, Selvi, Abhishek, <laughs> Bharat, Vikash, San, Pooja, Mayur, Sugendraj yes I already mentioned good evening let us continue with the discussion what you see here in front of you is a diagram which is you know continuously being asked the fetal circulation and in the fetal circulation as you see what you are looking at is say this is the umbilical vein left umbilical vein because uh, it is understood that when we are talking about fetal circulation the right umbilical vein regresses and left is left. So right umbilical vein will regress and left umbilical vein is left and this is the left umbilical vein which will be bringing the oxygenated blood from the mother through placenta. So mother will send the blood to placenta through the placenta the baby will receive the blood and it will be having high level of oxygen. Sometime they will ask you what is the percentage of oxygen here. So saturation you can take it as around 80 percent. In the umbilical vein, left umbilical vein, the blood which is passing is 80% saturated with oxygen. Now as you proceed further, this blood which is coming from the left umbilical vein is actually received by the liver, but then liver is immature and does not require much of blood. So you need a bypass channel. In the fetal circulation, there's a bypass channel which is called as the ductus venosus and it will bypass the liver. Little bit blood will go to liver, otherwise it will be bypassing via the ductus venosus in fetal circulation. And then you will find this blood is reaching the right atrium through inferior vena cava. So inferior vena cava brings the blood to the right atrium, but then this blood, most of it will not be reaching the right ventricle, it will be bypassing. You can magnify this diagram a bit. And as you do that, you will notice that this blood which came to the right atrium will be bypassing the lung because lungs are again immature, they don't require too much of blood. Moreover, they are not working for oxygenation in the fetal circulation. So how do you bypass the lung? There are two methods. One, you can use the foramen ovale and directly send the blood into left atrium and another bypass channel would be the ductus arteriosus, which we'll be talking about shortly. But at this moment, the mother 
when the mother sent the blood to the baby through placenta it is left umbilical vein which was having high level of oxygen vein but shown in red color because it is carrying oxygen more oxygen so this left umbilical vein using a bypass channel ductus venosus bypassing the liver and then using the inferior vena cava reaching the right atrium but from right atrium straight away going to left atrium using what is called as foramen ovale so this is foramen ovale and now the blood can enter left ventricle from the left ventricle this blood will enter the aorta and to the brain actually developing brain requires a lot of oxygen and you want much most of this oxygen to reach at the earliest possible level so this blood which come from the left ventricle now enters the aorta and through the aorta carotid arteries and to the brain and then this blood is being distributed to the head neck region upper limb thorax region abdomen region and as this blood keep on coming down the descending thoracic aorta the abdominal aorta and then there will be the bifurcation of abdominal aorta as the abdominal aorta is bifurcating there will be iliac arteries and from the iliac arteries you will find are coming umbilical arteries so umbilical arteries which are two in number right and left these umbilical arteries will be coming from anterior division of internal iliac artery i repeat the umbilical arteries which are two in number they will be coming from anterior division of internal iliac artery and they will be shown in blue color why they are shown in blue color because they have less of oxygen if you ask for the percentage of oxygen then you can mention the percentage of oxygen here would be 60% so you will mention that the blood which goes back into placenta is 60% and the blood which is coming from the placenta is 80% 80% saturation in left umbilical vein 60% saturation in the umbilical arteries right and left and this blood will be then along with the vein it will be umbilical cord and uh, the placenta now in this process when the baby is born uh, this uh, uh, the importance of ductus arteriosus also has to be discussed in fetal circulation you will see that some blood which was coming from the upper body that is the head neck or upper limb that will be draining through superior vena cava so what about the blood which is coming from superior vena cava you can show the blood which is coming from upper body through superior vena cava and as you show it here this is the superior vena cava sending the blood into right atrium again but it will be crossing criss crossing and this blood most of it will reach right ventricle and this is deoxygenated blood of course because it is vein superior vena cava so superior vena cava bringing the blood of the upper body body above diaphragm basically and entering into the right atrium right ventricle this blood is pushed into the pulmonary artery now the thing is this blood don't want to go to the lungs because again lungs are immature they are not requiring too much of blood flow in fetal circulation so you have to bypass the lung so this is second bypass channel for the lung and you use ductus arteriosus and uh, this blood will be then mixing in the descending thoracic aorta now this is fetal circulation a question has come recently they are asking ductus arteriosus is a derivative of which pharyngeal arch artery ductus arteriosus is a derivative of which pharyngeal arch artery and is it present on both side or only on left side see initially it is present on both side but later right regresses and left is left so ductus arteriosus initially you have both the sides but right regresses left is left so left sided ductus arteriosus will be left and ductus arteriosus is derived from which pharyngeal arch artery you know there are pharyngeal arches 1 2 3 4 5 6 six pharyngeal arch gives us the pulmonary artery and the ductus arteriosus so the pulmonary artery and ductus arteriosus which is left on the left side now will come from sixth pharyngeal arch artery that was your answer baby is born now so fetal circulation will be modified there will be some remnant they will be asking you a remnant another question in this all india pg about the remnants so what will happen to the left umbilical vein as you 
cut the umbilical cord, remove the placenta, the left umbilical vein must be obliterated. So as it is obliterated, it will be leaving behind, the adult remnant will be ligamentum teres. What is ligamentum teres? It is in the adult and it is adult remnant of left umbilical vein. Now as it comes from the umbilicus towards the liver, as it is coming from umbilicus towards the liver, it will be covered by a fold, peritoneal fold and that peritoneal fold is called as falciform ligament of liver. So there is a falciform ligament of liver and it is a double fold of peritoneum to carry the left umbilical vein in fetus and in adults which has become ligamentum teres. Now what about the ductus venosus in adult? Ductus venosus in adult will be obliterated of course and it will become ligamentum venosum. So ligamentum venosum is the adult remnant of the ductus venosus. What about the foramen ovale? Foramen ovale will close and the communication between two atria will be closed and it will become fossa ovalis. So fossa ovalis is the remnant of foramen ovale. What will happen to ductus arteriosus? Ductus arteriosus initially will have vasospasm which is called physiological obliteration of ductus arteriosus, physiological closure and after some time there will be tunica intima proliferation and you will have anatomical closures. So a question comes, ductus arteriosus physiological closure when does that happen? You say immediately after birth. Yes immediately after birth but when? And you can tell the physiological closure of ductus arteriosus is 24 hours to 96 hours. Now if you say 24 to 96 hours, you can say day 1 to day number 4 because some babies it will happen on the very first day and some babies it might be happening on day number 2 or day number 3 or day number 4. So if the vasospasm of the ductus arteriosus, physiological closure do not happen by day number 4, then it will be pathology. So if a question comes, when is physiological closure of ductus arteriosus happening? Your answer should be maximum by day number 4, which is 96 hours. And what if it is still open? If it is still open, then you might try to, you know, do some intervention, medical intervention, and uh, you can use some, you know, prostaglandin, all those pharmacologies there like uh, indomethacin you can use. Indomethacin will lead to closure of this ductus arteriosus but sometimes it might be required to keep it open if there is some congenital anomaly and if you want to keep it open then you might be giving some prostaglandins. Prostaglandin E can keep it you know uh, like it is more of pharmacology I don't want to go into much deep uh, depth but prostaglandin E they can keep the ductus arteriosus patent because even in fetal circulation there was a lot of prostaglandin which is helping the ductus arteriosus keeping it open. Okay? So endomethacin will end, endomethacin will end the ductus arteriosus flow and uh, this uh, uh, prostaglandins they can keep it patent. Sometimes you need to keep it patent if there is some you know, congenital anomalies. Again not going to those details. So normally when will be the anatomical closure? If you are talking about anatomical closure, then you can mention anatomical closure starts on day number 15 according to Gray's Anatomy and can be ending by third month which is week number 12. Now the problem is these are controversial questions. So you might be facing some controversy here but what I do is I read anatomy then physiology then radiology then pediatrics then pathology then medicine then surgery and pediatric surgery Nelson or whatever I read and uh, all my answers are basically uh, depending upon the type of questions and uh, sources I have told you I read almost all the books and latest editions always always read from latest editions. So what is the problem here? Problem here is that if they are asking the anatomical closure of ductus arteriosus what should I answer? Day number 15. If day number 15 is not given then you can say one month and if one month is not given then three months and three months is also week number 12. A question came it was asking when is anatomical closure of ductus arteriosus happening which is tunica intima proliferation and obliteration of the limen. When is anatomical closure of ductus arteriosus happening? And uh, choices were week number 2, 
6, 12, 18. Now, if you have week 2, 6, 12, 18, you have double answer because week 2, and according to Gray's Anatomy, and week number 12, according to Keith Elmore embryology. But the point is, you should take the maximum possible. Or to tell other way, if you have patency of ductus arteriosus beyond week number 12, then it is pathology. And you might think of surgical intervention. So the maximum you can allow for ductus arteriosus to be patent anatomically, the anatomical closure of ductus arteriosus maximum should happen by week number 12. If it is beyond week number 12, you must be thinking of some surgical correction. So the advice is, whenever choices come like week 2, week 6, week 12, week 18, you can have three answers here. But the best answer will be week number 12 because that is the maximum time. That is three months. Beyond three months, it is pathology. Like I told, in physiological closure, choose the maximum. That is the best answer. 96 hours or day number four. Otherwise, closure physiologically can happen on day number four, day number three, day number two, day number one. You can have all the answers. But which one to choose among them if there is a controversy? Week number this is day number four for physiological closure and week number 12 for anatomical closure. Now, what about the umbilical arteries? When they are obliterated, what will be the remnant in adult? In adults, they'll be actually remaining as the adult remnant of the right and left umbilical arteries, the medial umbilical ligament. So this question has come recently on India PG. You have to be careful now, see, what is the adult remnant of umbilical arteries? You are telling medial umbilical ligaments. But then these medial umbilical ligaments which are in the lower abdomen below the umbilicus, they'll be covered by some peritoneal fold again. And that peritoneal fold is called as medial umbilical fold. So there are two terms. Term number one, medial L, medial, medial umbilical ligament and there is medial umbilical fold. Let us talk about that now because the questions have, see I told you, you should practice previous questions for last five years. Once you are done, last 10 years. Once you are done, last 15 years and then 20 years. 20 years is the margin. You should not go beyond. Why I should study a question which came 20 years back? because questions repeat themselves. Very old questions can resurface again and they are reappearing. So these questions, they used to come and they are still coming. So that is the purpose of uh, telling you that you should be repeating. You should be actually preparing for your exams by practicing as many previous year questions as possible. So basically we are looking at the lower abdominal wall, this is umbilicus, and below umbilicus, you'll have some peritoneum. And that peritoneum will cover some structures forming peritoneal folds. And peritoneal folds are different than the ligaments which we will be talking about. So what about the peritoneal folds? You will see in the midline there is a peritoneal fold and that peritoneal fold which is in the midline is called as the median because it is in the midline median umbilical fold now be careful median umbilical fold is different and median umbilical ligament is different so what is the medial umbilical fold then it is a pattern fold which will be covering the median umbilical ligament then what is median umbilical ligament? Median umbilical ligament attaches to the apex of urinary bladder. It attaches to apex of urinary bladder. In embryology, it was allantois. Then that allantois had lumen. Then the lumen gets obliterated, fibrous, and it became uracus. Again, in the fetal life, there was a structure attaching to apex of urinary bladder, allantois. Allantois had some lumen. Allantois doesn't work in humans, basically. So it got obliterated, it became fibrous, it became uracus. And that uracus, in adult, is given a third name, and which is the median umbilical ligament. And that median umbilical ligament, which is nothing but the uracus, 
which is nothing but the lentois. So in the beginning, it is the lentois. Later becomes obliterated lumen, uracus. But uracus in adult is called as uracus is in the fetus. Uracus in adult is called as median umbilical ligament. And that median umbilical ligament is covered by a peritoneal fold. And that fold is called as median umbilical fold. So four names are there. Number one, allentois. Number two, uracus in fetus. And then number three, median umbilical ligament. And number four, median umbilical fold. Now this is median. What about the medial? We have discussed medial also. This is the two medial umbilical folds. Now when you are telling they are medial L, you see this is N, this is L. There'll be two medial umbilical folds. What are they? I have just told you the medial umbilical folds are basically the peritoneal folds covering two umbilical arteries which are obliterated. So medial umbilical folds are peritoneal folds covering the obliterated umbilical arteries. What is the name of um, obliterated umbilical arteries in adult? That is the medial umbilical ligament. So medial umbilical fold when you say, when you are telling this is median, medial L, medial umbilical fold, it is fold means peritoneal fold. But what is it covering? Ligament. Adult remnant of umbilical artery is called medial umbilical ligament. So be careful, there is a difference between fold and the ligament. But then comes a third entity, which is the lateral most. There's a third entity which is lateral most, and as you can use some other color, maybe yellow color here. So this one is called as lateral umbilical fold. Now when you say this is the lateral umbilical fold, what is it again? The lateral umbilical fold is a peritoneal fold. Yeah, of course it is a peritoneal fold, but what is it covering? It'll cover the inferior epigastric artery and vein. It is covering the inferior epigastric artery and vein. And they are working. They are not obliterated. They work in adult. So if you are looking at this now, this. This one is the lateral umbilical fold. And this lateral umbilical fold, as you are talking about, what is it? It is peritoneal fold. Then what is it covering? Some artery vein. And which artery vein? That is the inferior epigastric artery and vein. Surgical importance of this inferior epigastric artery and vein is in clinics you will know if a hernia comes lateral to this, you will call it as indirect inguinal hernia. If a hernia comes medial to this, you will call it as the direct inguinal hernia. So this is indirect inguinal hernia and this is direct inguinal hernia. So what is the boundary line between the two? If the hernia is lying lateral to inferior epigastric vessels, it is the indirect inguinal hernia mostly happening congenitally in the young people. So congenital young boy, you can say mostly happens in males, so congenitally young boy. And what about the direct inguinal hernia? Direct inguinal hernia are medial to the inferior epigastric vessels, which were raising a fold called lateral umbilical fold. And uh, the hernia is mostly seen in adult males or older males. Why it is in more common in elderly males? Because, you know, they are uh, weakness of the abdominal wall and uh, the weakness in the inguinal canal. And there might be some omentum coming out or intestine coming out or bladder coming out. So you can have omentoseal, enteroseal or vesicoseal. So with this information, we are moving further. Let me just see in the chat if you have any queries because mostly I get so lost in teaching. Loss of contact with the environment. 
endomethacin or ibuprofen again because it is pharmacology i'll think uh, better you consult your pharmacology faculty but i believe endomethacin will end the ductus arteriosus it will close the ductus arteriosus is used in clinical practice okay so i think we can continue now i will look into one uh, query here this question actually has come examiner gave you one uh, vein a marker on the vein and it was asking that what is this vein embryologically derived from so first of all we have to identify what is this vein you can see that this is a coronal section anterior thoracic wall has been removed and you are looking at posterior thoracic wall how do you know it is thoracic wall because i can see the ribs so ribs can be seen vertebral column can be seen this is the vertebral column those are the ribs and uh, what we have done is we have uh, taken a coronal section and removed the anterior thoracic wall so that you can look at the posterior thoracic wall posterior thoracic wall to the right side you have a large vein and that large vein to the right side in the posterior thoracic wall running on the vertebral column is the a zygous vein now when you said this is a zygous vein the question was a zygous vein is derived from and it is some cardinal vein embryologically which cardinal vein embryologically the question on the formation of these veins and inferior vena cava are very frequent frequently asked though they were asked more in gypmer exam but they are also appearing in all india pg inict and uh, you should know that inict is the exam where the faculty who prepare the questions will belong to jipmer as well because inict the aspirants they will be you know going into jipmer uh, uh, they are going into aims they are going into nevhans they are going into uh, other uh, national level the what is the full form of inict the institutes of national importance so multiple institutes are there a single exam is being conducted you know all that <laughs> i should not be telling you all this but the thing is jipmer uh, people are still existing in the examining body so they will be asking you about the inferior vena cava formation let us revise it now so as you proceed further you will notice that there are these questions will keep coming if you think they will uh, suddenly disappear because jipmer exam has disappeared that is not going to happen okay anyway so what about the details as you proceed further you have to understand inferior vena cava superior vena cava they are developing on both sides but then the left sided structures will regress and right sided structures will be uh, uh, presenting themselves in the adult in the beginning you have two svc and two ivc but then svc and ivc in adult is present only on right side what happens to the left svc or left ivc they disappear but some people it might be there you can have double inferior vena cava double superior vena cava so why do you have a double superior vena cava it should be only on the right side because persistent veins on the left side so which veins are persistent on the left side that you were having a double ivc or double svc are questions which you should be practicing but anyway when we are talking about svc ivc there are some cardinal veins which will be embryological and give you these uh, structures so as you talk about them there are some cardinal veins which are you know embryological precursors and uh, then they are giving you adult derivatives like superior vena cava is easy to remember because there is only one which is to be remembered anterior cardinal vein so anterior cardinal vein will contribute to superior vena cava but inferior vena cava has multiple contribution so when inferior vena cava is having multiple contribution what are the contributions for inferior vena cava we can have posterior cardinal vein supra cardinal vein sub cardinal vein now these are the veins which we are supposed to discuss as you do that you will notice that in the beginning there will be only anterior cardinal vein for upper body and posterior cardinal vein for lower body so we can show them here for the upper body we are having let us uh, take some color which is evident in the diagram so this is the two of them and we are telling this is anterior cardinal vein on the right side 
anterior carotid vein on the left side, draining the upper body, like head, neck, upper limb will drain into anterior carotid veins embryologically in the fetal circulation. Then you will have the posterior cardinal veins and posterior cardinal veins as you show them here these are the right sided posterior cardinal vein and left sided posterior cardinal vein and they'll be draining the lower body so upper body anterior cardinal vein and lower body posterior cardinal vein that is why anterior cardinal vein will contribute to superior vena cava draining the upper body anterior cardinal vein is giving us superior vena cava then what about the posterior cardinal vein of course posterior cardinal vein is draining the body which is below inferior vena cava now not only posterior cardinal vein is giving us not only posterior cardinal vein is giving us inferior vena cava you have some other names what about them yes we will discuss them but at this moment you should know that anterior cardinal vein and posterior cardinal vein they join to form what is called as common cardinal vein and common cardinal vein drain into the heart because all the venous blood must drain into the heart. So once again, we can mention here what we are telling is anterior cardinal vein, posterior cardinal vein, they join to form common cardinal vein on right side and common cardinal vein on left side. And then they'll drain into the heart. This is the beginning. Later, the posterior cardinal veins, they are regressing. They regress and replaced by some other veins. So which other veins they'll be replaced by? The posterior cardinal vein will be replaced by the veins like supracardinal and subcardinal, and they will be contributing to inferior vena cava partly. So what, where are those contributions? We have to discuss. Now let us start with the formation of, say, let us use some dark color. Say, iliac veins, the iliac veins joining to form initial part of inferior vena cava. So what we are showing is the two common iliac veins, two common iliac veins joining to form the initial part, beginning of inferior vena cava. The common iliac veins and beginning of inferior vena cava is said to be contributed by posterior cardinal veins later replaced by sacrocardinal veins. So we are telling that what is in the beginning, posterior cardinal vein, and what is it replaced by, sacrocardinal vein. You know sacrum is there, sacrum pelvic region. So sacrum pelvic region, there you have the iliac veins and uh, joining to form the beginning of inferior vena cava. Question can ask you, proximal portion of inferior vena cava is derived from? You will say posterior cardinal vein, but more specifically, sacrocardinal vein. And that is what you can see here. The posterior cardinal vein, which you are talking about, can be also written as sacrocardinal vein, and they'll form a portion of IVC and common iliac veins. I'll repeat, showing you here, this portion will receive the venous blood from the kidney, means renal vein, draining into inferior vena cava, and renal veins and this part of inferior vena cava will have a separate origin. Whereas the inferior vena cava, which you will show here, this part of inferior vena cava, which is in the middle, like portion one, you can write here, this is portion one, this is portion two, and this is portion three. So where is portion one of IVC coming from? That is posterior cardinal vein becoming sacrocardinal vein. And where is portion two coming from? We still have to find out. And where is portion number three or the renal portion of inferior vena cava coming from that we have to discuss. And then there's a portion four also. But before you talk about portion four, let us look at two and three. So where is this second part of inferior vena cava coming from? You can see here, they are the veins which are called supra cardinal veins. So supracardinal veins, they contribute to infrarenal IVC. I'll repeat again. Supracardinal veins will contribute to infrarenal IVC and they also contribute to azygous venous system in the thorax. I'll repeat. Infrarenal portion of inferior vena cava is contributed by 
the supracarnal veins and they also contribute to azygous venous system which is thoracic veins. So you can have azygous vein, hemiazygous vein and the thorax they are all coming from supracardinal vein. What was your question? In the, exam the examiner gave you posterior thoracic wall. In the posterior thoracic wall one arrow was on azygous vein. Question was azygous vein is derived from and your answer? Your answer is azygous vein is derived from supracardinal vein. And this supracardinal vein also form a portion of IVC. Which portion of IVC? The infrarenal portion of IVC. Then will form the renal portion of IVC. The renal portion of IVC is formed by, as you can see for yourself, the subcardinal vein. Subcardinal vein in embryology will form renal portion of IVC and also renal vein, gonadal vein. Renal vein, gonadal vein. You know, gonadal veins drain into inferior vena cava via renal veins. So gonadal veins drain into inferior vena cava via renal veins or gonadal vein, renal vein or renal portion of IVC come from subcardinal veins. Now this much I have shown you in the diagram. Let us revise this and as you revise this you can draw it yourself. What I want you to understand is that inferior vena cava formation is a complex process it will have four parts to discuss. So if inferior vena cava has four parts to discuss, what are the four parts? This is part number one, two, three and four. We have discussed only three of them. Can you tell me the beginning of inferior vena cava is contributed by which veins embryologically? So as you say the beginning of inferior vena cava the beginning of inferior vena cava is contributed by posterior cardinal vein. And uh, what is the other name of posterior cardinal vein? They are also called sacrocardinal veins. So initial portion of IVC is contributed by posterior cardinal vein, replaced by sacrocardinal vein. What about the infrarenal portion of inferior vena cava? Now when you say the infrarenal portion of IVC, we already know the infrarenal portion of IVC is contributed by supracardinal veins and these supracardinal veins not only they were contributing to infrarenal IVC they were also contributing to the azygous venous system in the thorax. So azygous vein in the thorax along with the azygous and hemizygous veins and the infrarenal portion of IVC derived from supracardinal veins. Then you can look at the kidneys also. These are the kidneys and kidneys they drain into IVC. So kidneys drain into IVC and this portion of IVC which you are showing now here, this portion of IVC or renal portion of IVC. Not only renal portion of IVC but also the renal veins and the Gonadal veins, you know, gonadal veins are like this. This is the left gonadal vein draining into left renal vein. And this is the right gonadal vein draining directly into inferior vena cava. I'll repeat. Left gonadal vein draining into left renal vein drain into the inferior vena cava. And right renal, right gonadal vein drain directly into inferior vena cava. But where are these gonadal veins, renal veins or renal portion of IVC coming from? And your answer is this is all coming from subcardinal veins, subcardinal veins. So you have some names to remember. And how do I remember these names? In class 9, my class 9, I used to study chemistry. There was a book PL Sony Chemistry. I always read the preface. In the preface it was written. Any chapter which you read in this book, in the beginning it will take 8 hours. To finish one chapter 8 hours. In the next reading it will take 4 hours. In the next reading it will take half an hour. And before exam it will take just 5 minutes. I will repeat again. I was in 9th standard. I was going into 10th standard. I wanted to have a good book in chemistry. There is a PL Sony chemistry year 1987 somewhere. And in the preface of the book it is written how to read the book. 
and it is written. In this book, there are a lot of chapters. To read one chapter, the first reading will take eight hours. Same chapter, second reading, four hours. Third reading, half an hour. Fourth reading, five minutes. Because if tomorrow is the exam and I want to read a chapter today, I cannot spend much time on that. I will have only five minutes because there are so many chapters to read from. So my point is, in the first go, you may not remember nothing. By tomorrow morning, you will forget what I told you today evening. Today evening, I told you something. Tomorrow morning, everything is gone, volatile. We have a tendency to forget. And to forget is very normal. It is pretty normal. If you are a human, you are supposed to forget. But there are some things which we don't want to forget. So what do you do? It is called as revision. It is called revision. What is revision? Look again. Look again. And uh, tomorrow morning, you look again. But after 10 days, you will forget. So look again. Because we will keep forgetting. So keep looking again. Revise, revise, revise. Now the thing is, if you revise this video two, three times, it will stop registering in your brain. Because we get tolerance. There's a tolerance. If you practice one question many times, after some time, you will practice it. But it will not be registered by your brain. It is called tolerance. So what should I do? You should practice a particular topic from different books, different questions, different videos, and then look at it from various angles. Then it will stay with you. If you want to become a cardiothoracic surgeon, of course. If you want to become a cardiothoracic surgeon, then you are supposed to know what is retro cable IVC, what is double IVC, why there is double IVC. But at this moment, you are just a pure MBBS student trying to enter into your MS surgery. After MS surgery, you will do MCS surgery, cardiothoracic surgeon and whatever you will become. That time, this will all be important, but you should inculcate the habit right now. Sir, in one line, one line, summarize in one line. My one line is always one line. Practice as many previous year questions as possible. That is the one line. Practice as many previous questions as possible. And I do not teach any topic which is of not use, which is, you know, just wasting your time. No, that I don't do. They are all important topics. Now, just to give you another, you know, because I told you, you we have a tendency to forget. So, and what about this fourth part? Where is this fourth part coming? I told you, in fear of Keva. Develops on both sides, but right veins, they regress. So you should focus more on, on the left side, they'll regress more on right side. Right-sided umbilical vein. So there will be a right-sided umbilical vein which will contribute and right-sided umbilical vein contribute to the inferior vena cava which is between the diaphragm and right atrium. Diaphragm and right atrium or between lever and the right atrium. That is why it is called hepato cardiac portion of inferior vena cava. So this is hepatocardiac portion of inferior vena cava or the inferior vena cava which is above the diaphragm. So above the diaphragm, I have inferior vena cava which enters into right atrium. Where would it come from? Lever. What is lever? Hepato, hepatocardiac portion of inferior vena cava. So hepatocardiac portion of inferior vena cava, terminal portion of inferior vena cava, where it came from? Right umbilical vein. The right umbilical vein forms right hepatocardiac channel. The right umbilical vein will form right hepatocardiac channel and that right hepatocardiac channel will form the terminal portion of inferior vena cava. With that, I'll revise quickly. You can see for yourself, this is the diagram which we should not forget for the formation of inferior vena cava. Let me repeat the information and uh, it should stay with you for a long time. Posterior cardinal vein, which is also called sacrocardinal vein, will form the beginning of inferior vena cava. So beginning of inferior vena cava means common iliac vein and the initial portion of inferior vena cava. Then what about the infrarenal IVC? Infrarenal IVC, if you ask me, then I will tell. Supracardinal veins will form infrarenal IVC. And not only the supracardinal veins will form infrarenal IVC, they are also contributing to azygous 
venous system in the thorax. So thorax will have a zygous venous system, that is zygous venous system and infradenal portion of IVC come from supracardinal veins, as simple as that. That was your question, this is your answer. What about the renal IVC? If you say renal IVC, let us change the color and you can say that the renal IVC is coming from subcardinal veins. And subcardinal veins not only form the renal IVC, it will also form the renal vein and left gonadal vein, right gonadal vein. So right gonadal vein, left gonadal vein, renal vein or renal IVC will come from subcardinal vein. What about the terminal portion of the inferior vena cava or hepatocardic portion? The hepatocardic portion, as you can see, hepatocardiac portion is coming from right vitalin vein and right vitalin vein forming right hepatocardiac channel. So right hepatocardiac channel is forming the right hepatocardiac or the hepatocardiac portion of inferior vena cava. So these are the four parts of inferior vena cava. I hope this should help you in remembering the things. These questions are coming recently and they are asking you the arrangement of structures. Okay, uh, let me see if any queries in the chat. You want to make a chart for median versus medial fold. Okay, I can just make a table and that table will help you. Uh, let us do one thing. Uh, because you might get confused, I can understand. So let us do one thing, uh, as you are asking. We are uh, talking about, say, the ligaments and the folds. Now, start from the midline. In the midline, you are having what is called as allantois, and allantois becomes the uracus. Uracus will become the median M umbilical ligament and this median umbilical ligament will be covered by what is called as the median N umbilical fold. I'll repeat again. In the beginning, in fetal circulation, this is fetal circulation, fetal stage. In fetal stage, there was a lentois with lumen, uracus without lumen, it is a fibrous structure. In adults, it is called median umbilical ligament covered by median umbilical fold. This is one thing. Now, second thing is, in the fetal circulation, we were having, say, left umbilical vein. And that left umbilical vein in the fetal circulation becomes ligamentum teres of lever. And that ligamentum teres of lever going above the umbilicus will be raising a fold, peritoneal fold, peritoneal fold that is called as falciform ligament of lever. Falciform ligament of lever. Surgically they are all important. So left umbilical vein in fetal circulation becomes left, uh, this is ligamentum teres of lever in adult and raising liga falciform ligament of lever. Then what about the other ligaments? Say we were having two umbilical arteries and these two umbilical arteries, they become medial, medial, medial L, umbilical ligaments, because here we are showing the ligaments. So two umbilical arteries in fetal circulation, in adult it is medial L, umbilical ligament. What is it covered by? A fold. And what is that fold called? Same name, medial umbilical fold medial umbilical fold. There's a median umbilical fold which is only one and medial umbilical fold will be two. There will be two. This is one. And falciform ligament is one because vein was one. And what about the other fold which was lateral? If you say lateral umbilical fold, if you are talking about the lateral, there is inferior epigastric artery and vein. Inferior epigastric artery and vein and that inferior epigastric artery and vein do not form any ligament because it is still persisting, it, is, it works in adult. So it has not become obliterated. There is no ligament for that. If there is no ligament for that, then what is? Fold. And what is that fold called? Lateral umbilical fold. It is called lateral umbilical fold. These are peritoneal folds. So there will be no ligament here. 
and inferior biggest artery and vein are still persisting in adults and there will be just no ligament but just the lateral umbilical fold. I hope this will help you. Now the next topic which we want to talk about is the arrangement of structures adil and hilum. They are asking what is the arrangement of structure of the pulmonary vein, artery and bronchus anterior to posterior or what is the arrangement of structures superior to inferior. So these questions they used to come long back and they have reappeared again and uh, this might appear easy to you because it is just a cramming or memory based thing but if you have some logic to remember things then it always is good and uh, then they give you transverse section also transverse section sometime cadaveric images and sometime radiology images so we'll look at one transverse section as well but at this moment if you are looking from the front view you know what happens is there is trachea there is this trachea and trachea brings oxygen to the lungs so when you say this is the trachea which brings oxygen to the lungs the oxygen will go to the alveoli so this is the trachea which is bringing oxygen to the lung and this oxygen will be going into the lung alveoli this is one thing second thing the heart will pump into pulmonary artery and pulmonary artery will take the deoxygenated blood to the lung for oxygenation. That is why pulmonary artery, though it is artery, it is shown in blue color in adult circulation. This is adult, adult circulation. So the heart will be having some venous blood. Let us show that this heart is having some venous blood and that venous blood is carried by pulmonary artery, right pulmonary artery, left pulmonary artery. So right pulmonary artery, left pulmonary artery and giving it to the lungs. Now as the pulmonary arteries give this blood to the lung, it is oxygenated in the alveolus respiratory gas exchange. And once the oxygen comes into the lungs, alveolus, it will be sending it back to the heart. And how does it reach the heart? To reach the heart, it will be using some veins, two on right side, two on left side, and they are called as the pulmonary veins. So superior inferior pulmonary veins. There will be superior inferior pulmonary vein on right side, superior inferior pulmonary vein on left side. Red color. Why are you showing the veins in red color? Because they are carrying the oxygenated blood from the lung into the heart. Same thing I will show here. Let us start with trachea. As you are starting with the trachea, you will find that this is the trachea which brings the oxygenated oxygen into the lung and it is dividing into right principal bronchus, left principal bronchus. Let me zoom the area there so that it becomes a bit more clear. As you see here, we are talking about the trachea giving us right left principal bronchus. You have to be careful to know that right principal bronchus is short as compared with left and because right principal bronchus is short it bifurcates before it enters the lung. There will be two of them entering the lung. So on the left side it will be single. So left principal bronchus is single as it enters the left lung at the root of the lung, hilum of the lung, but on the right side. Since right principal bronchus is short length, it has already divided. And there are two of the bronchi which enter the right lung. So right lung, the hilum or the root of lung will have two bronchi entering. On the left it is only one. Now these bronchi they gave oxygen to the lung. What else enters the lung? the heart sending pulmonary arteries. So where are the pulmonary arteries? You can see the pulmonary arteries are now lying anterior to the bronchus. Why pulmonary arteries are lying anterior to bronchus? See bronchus thick wall artery is also thick wall but not as thick as bronchus. So it is better to keep a thickest wall posterior, thin wall a thick wall anterior and thinnest wall most anterior. So which is the thickest wall? Bronchus. Which is the thick wall? Artery. And which is the thin wall? The vein. Veins, better you keep them more anterior. But at this moment, you are talking about the heart sending deoxygenated blood into pulmonary arteries. So where are the pulmonary arteries? You see the heart has been removed which was sending 
the blue blood into lung. This is the left pulmonary artery and this is the right pulmonary artery. Though it is shown as bifurcating, but it is not bifurcating. Single trunk will enter the right as well as left lung. One artery will enter. So you are telling bronchus is most posterior. Yes, arteries in the middle. Yes, and veins are most anterior. Thin wall, veins are more anterior. How many veins on right side? How many veins on left side? They are shown in red color. Superior inferior pulmonary vein, right? Superior inferior pulmonary vein, left. So as you are telling, these are the veins and you can show them in this uh, color. Let us take this color only. This is superior pulmonary vein. This is inferior pulmonary vein on right side. And uh, as you see, this is the left-sided superior pulmonary vein and left-sided inferior pulmonary veins. My point is simple. You just have to remember VAB, anterior to posterior. VAB, anterior to posterior. What is that? VAB, vein artery bronchus. Vein artery bronchus, anterior to posterior. So when you say vein artery bronchus is anterior to posterior, which vein? Pulmonary veins and then pulmonary artery and then bronchus. This was the question. This question has come many times and again it has come recently. So I know the order now. But the problem is when they ask you order superior to inferior. What is the arrangement of structure superior to inferior? Then you have to remember some mnemonic. I'll give you the mnemonic there. But one thing before I give you the mnemonic you should remember is the superior pulmonary vein is much more anterior and is not in line which we are talking about. The line which is the examiner talking about arrangement of structure superior to inferior. So when the structure is asked superior to inferior at the lung hilum, the arrangement of structure superior to inferior at the lung hilum, you are not supposed to include the superior pulmonary vein. You have to include only inferior pulmonary vein. But why? Should I not include the superior pulmonary vein? And why should I include inferior pulmonary vein? Because this line you are talking about, arrangement of structure of the artery, bronchus and vein is in line with inferior pulmonary vein. The superior pulmonary vein is much more anterior. So you are not supposed to talk about that. Okay, if I exclude this as per your explanation, what is the arrangement of structure then? In the left lung, Atal Bihari Vajpayee. Atal Bihari Vajpayee. When you say Atal Bihari Vajpayee, Atal A for artery, pulmonary artery, Bihari B, bronchus and Vajpayee V, the vein, inferior pulmonary vein. So in the left lung, superior to inferior, Atal Bihari Vajpayee. I'll draw a diagram and repeat it. But this is right, this is left lung. What about the right lung? Because in right lung you have epiarterial bronchus and hypoarterial bronchus. Epiarterial bronchus and hypoarterial bronchus. One bronchus is above the artery, epiartery, one is below the artery. See, first of all, we should tell don't include superior pulmonary vein in arrangement of structure superior to inferior. Why? Because superior pulmonary vein is much more anterior. Exclude it. Okay, then what about the inferior pulmonary vein? Same. Mnemonic. What is the same mnemonic? Atal Bihari Vajpayee. But on the head of Atal, there is a bronchus. So here also it is Atal Bihari Vajpayee. But on the head of Atal, there is a bronchus. Which, which bronchus? Epiarteal bronchus. So epiarteal bronchus, yes. And then Atal, the artery, pulmonary artery. And Bihari, the bronchus. And vein, the inferior pulmonary vein. Now to revise. As you revise this, I'll draw a simple diagram and it will be easy for you to remember and what we are telling is first of all what we told was we mentioned say this is the midline of the body this is right side front view left side front view We're looking from the front view this is midline right and left you have told one thing that in the lung hilum there is this mnemonic we are telling Atal Bihari Vajpay I hope you no, who is this? Former Prime Minister? Atal Bihari Vajpayee. And A is for artery, but artery in blue color. The pulmonary artery, 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 left side. A for A, artery, pulmonary artery. And what about Bihari? 
it is the bronchus so this bronchus you can say and that is b for bronchus b for bronchus and what about the v v v is vein shown in red color v is vein shown in red color which vein the pulmonary vein which pulmonary vein inferior pulmonary vein because superior is not in relation so atal bihari vajpayee the pulmonary artery bronchus and inferior pulmonary vein what about the left lung left lung is same story atal bihari vajpayee you can draw again this is the artery pulmonary artery and then this is the bronchus which is already bifurcated if it is already bifurcated then where will you show the other one that will talk about but atal bihari and vajpayee the vein so which vein this will be the inferior pulmonary vein because superior you are not supposed to look into okay if you are telling that fine but uh, what is the difference between right lung hilum and left lung hilum that right principal bronchus is short it has already bifurcated there is a ap arterial and hypo arterial bronchus on the head of atal there is a bronchus on the head of atal there is a bronchus so on the head of atal which bronchus on the head of atal the bronchus is simply called as ap artery bronchus this is hypo artery bronchus so ap arterial bronchus and hypo arterial bronchus yes this is artery now the question which examiner will ask you which is the superior most structure in the left lung hilum which is the superior most structure in the left lung hilum your answer is artery pulmonary artery and what is the superior most structure in the right lung hilum what is the superior most structure in the right lung hilum bronchus which bronchus ap arterial bronchus i hope this will help you now what we need to do is see we should not forget our exam we should not forget we should not deviate too much from the axis it is not first year mbbs yesterday there was a comment i did not actually i don't talk about people too much but uh, there are some teachers who teach you in such way that you are first year mbbs student i don't teach first year students like this it is different total first year students are just the past 12th and they come and we can just keep them in our lap also give them food because they are not interested in learning so we will pamper them pampering and then we'll teach them very softly very that i don't do for the classes which are for pg entrance exam you are veterans now you have fought wars you have passed your first year mbbs pathology pharmacology medicine surgery now you are war veterans i cannot pamper you and anyway pampering means destroying you because pg entrance exam is not easy exam so i i have to be tough if the commander is tough soldier will not die in war but if the commander is like a loving mother the very first bullet will hit you and you will never know that you ever existed so there's a difference between a teacher and a teacher all teachers are good but all teachers are not good for all exams there are some teachers who are very good for first year mbbs but they are not good for pg entrance exam there's a difference and you can yourself make out the difference once you give the entrance exam and you fail it you know success is a lousy teacher if you are successful you will be behaving like a james bond but failure is the real teacher once you fail then you realize that which teacher you were learning from and then you will realize the caliber of the teacher there is a difference in the caliber of teachers and a teacher should be honest in whatever he is delivering that honesty is missing that is a problem anyway now you get these questions cadaveric images and radiology images also so in radiology images what do you want to discuss here see it is a section which you can see for yourself taken here yeah taken here but where thorax region which vertebra that vertebra is t5 t5 means the aorta has this uh, trachea has already bifurcated yes tracheal bifurcation upper border of t5 tracheal bifurcation at upper border of t5 vertebra this is the vertebra so this is the vertebra you are telling this is the body of vertebra the spine 
posterior, the transverse process, this is where spinal cord will be there, vertebral canal. So T5 vertebra, yes. And trachea has already bifurcated, yes. Trachea has bifurcated at T4-5 level, or you can say upper border of T5, it is bifurcated. So there you'll have carina, carina. This is the carina, this is carina. So if this is carina, where is the trachea? Trachea, you can see, this is, let us uh, use some other color. This is because all the CT scans are seen, inferior to superior. This is a patient going into CT scan. The CT scans are, if you have taken a transverse section like this, then inferior to superior. So this is left, this is right. This is left, this is right. So this is the right principal bronchus, and this is left principal bronchus, left main bronchus of left principal bronchus. So bronchi are already bifurcated. And there is a carina, that is the carina. You will see the carina at T5 vertebra level. Now if this is the bronchus, it was posterior most? Yes, because our mnemonic was VAB. What is VAB? VAB is our mnemonic anterior to posterior. So which was most posterior? B, the bronchus. Then what was more anterior? The heart deoxygenated blood sent to lung by pulmonary arteries. So you can show that detail now. See, this is the left sided. Let us choose some color now. Let us say this uh, because it is a vein. Uh, it is an artery but with deoxygenated blood. So pulmonary artery coming from the left ventricle, pulmonary artery coming from uh, right ventricle, right ventricle sending blood to the lung is bifurcating now. So what is the name of these vessels? This is the right pulmonary artery and left pulmonary artery. So this is the pulmonary trunk bifurcating into two. As you are telling, this is the right side, this is left side. So right pulmonary artery, left pulmonary artery. Where, what about the veins? Veins are more anterior. So where is the vein? You can see the veins will show in red color now. And as you are showing the veins in red, because the red should be evident, let me use this color. This is the vein. This is the vein which you can tell is uh, the left pulmonary vein. And this is, on this side you can show the, you know, it is actually because these sections, the CT scans, they'll be overlapping structures, so I don't want to comment, but there'll be a vein on this side, also the left and the right pulmonary veins. See, my point was simple. My point was, what is the arrangement of structure anterior to posterior? And we already told, VAB. Why the vein is most anterior? Thin wall. What is the artery in the middle? Thick wall. And what about the bronchus? Thickest wall. So V, A, B, anterior to posterior. V, A, B, anterior to posterior. This is the right lung hilum, that is left lung hilum. What other structures can you see here? If you look at the lung, the right lung, it will be empty shadow, dark shadow because full of air. This is the empty shadow of left lung. So left lung, empty shadow. What is this bone here, anteriorly? This bone anteriorly here must be the sternum. If that is the sternum, what is this? What is this? What is this? Because the ribs are obliquely placed, there will be multiple rib coming into sections. And what is this uh, joint between the rib and the vertebra? There are two joints, namely costo, costo is rib, costo vertebral and costo transverse joint. But remember, may it be costo vertebral or costo transverse joint, both are plain synovial joint. Why do you need a synovial joint here? I need synovial joint here to have free movement during breathing breathing. So you are telling that this is sternum, yes, and this is multiple ribs in section because uh, ribs are obliquely placed, multiple ribs will come in a single section, a transverse section. So when the rib is articulating with the vertebra, there will be two joints, one is the with the body and one is with the transverse process, maybe costo uh, vertebral joint or costo transverse joint, both are plain synovial joint. What about this joint? which is between rib and the costal cartilage. You answer in the chat. Let me at least interact some. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, okay. Some people think that I'm cute. I don't know why they think I'm cute. I cannot say I'm the best anatomy teacher. It'll be not a statement I will ever make. I will never be the best anatomy teacher because I still remember my anatomy teachers. Dr. Balakrishna, who taught us embryology in our Bangalore Medical College. I cannot be like him. You know, the, Dr. Balakrishna, he was MSc anatomy from Ames, year 93. Dr. Balakrishna, he was MSc anatomy from Ames, Delhi. He taught us embryology and he had dissected elephant. He had done dissection on elephant and he used to teach us embryology. So if I ever say in my life that I am the best teacher in anatomy, it will be a false statement. False. F. There are much more better teachers than me. How can I dishonor them, disrespect them? I am nowhere. <laughs> I am nowhere. But I try my best. They are my idols and there are many. And uh, actually I am a self-learned man. I have learned things myself, but there are some teachers which I will never forget and they were very good. Maybe that time when they used to teach us, I, we used to uh, wonder like uh, we never uh, valued them basically. But once you become old, then you learn the value of, but the time is gone. <laughs> Hindi mein kahawat hai, aamle ka khaya hua, kadwa lagta hai, baad mein meetha lagta hai. जब अब आपकी उम्र जो है ना अब जब मैं अब बात कर रहा हूं आपको मेरी बातें कड़वी लग सकती हैं क्या बोल रहे हैं वो बातें मीठी लगेंगी आज से 20 साल के बाद ये हकीकत है तो मेरी उम्र 50 साल है मगर मेरे टीचर की उम्र 90 साल है और 90 साल में भी आई कुड नॉट फॉलो हिम बट आई थिंक ही इज डिप्लोमा ईएनटी नाउ जो डॉक्टर बालाकृष्णा हैं उन्होंने डिप्लोमा ईएनटी किया था और ईएनटी का कुछ वो करते हैं मतलब सो आई कैन नॉट बी द बेस्ट टीचर एवर बिकॉज़ देयर विल बी समबडी हु इज फार अहेड इन नॉलेज ओके इज रैपिड रिवीजन अनफ फॉर आईएनआईसीटी एग्जाम यस रैपिड रिवीजन इज क्वाइट अनफ फॉर योर आईएनआईसीटी एग्जाम आई एग्री बट इफ यू कैन मास्टर द नॉलेज मींस व्हाट एवर आई एम डिलीवरिंग इट शुड बी विद यू एंड टू मेक इट विद यू यू शुड रिवाइज इट थ्री फोर टाइम्स एट लीस्ट बिकॉज इट बिकम्स वोलेटाइल स्टडिंग फ्रॉम रैपिड रिवीजन अदरवाइज मोर देन व्हाट यू रिक्वायर ओके यस Yes, you have answered. So, as I was asking for this question, which is costochondral joint, costochondral joint. All costochondral joints are, all costochondral joints are primary cartilaginous joint, synchondrosis. Primary cartilaginous joint, synchondrosis. Now, if we are telling that uh, all the costo chondral joints are synchondrosis primary cartilage joint what about this joint when the ribs are meeting the sternum the true ribs meet with sternum the true ribs meet with sternum so when the true ribs meet with sternum uh, most of them will have plain synovial joint and why again you are having plain synovial joint because i want movement for breathing except the first rib except the first rib because for first rib the chondrosternal joint this is chondrosternal joint this is chondrosternal joint for the first rib the chondrosternal joint is a misnomer but called as synchondrosis so the point is all the costochondral joints are all the costochondral joints are primary cartilage joint synchondrosis and the first rib which is chondrosternal the first rib only is the chondrosternal primary cartilage joint you can say synchondrosis otherwise all the ribs like 2 3 4 6 7 2 2 7 7 2 they are plain synovial joint so these are all questions which examiner ask i don't think they will appear now because your pattern is changing towards next pattern or uh, there will be more clinical questions less of anatomical questions direct anatomy questions will be few and that is in the thorax let us move on to upper limb now 
as we are talking about upper limb, there will always be questions about Arp's palsy and Klumpke's palsy. Arp's palsy and Klumpke's palsy. So let us talk about that. One hour spent on thorax. Actually, one hour, 15 minutes. Okay. Anyway. So what about this uh, Arp's palsy or Klumpke's palsy? Will these questions will ever stop coming? No, because they are clinical cases and uh, there are such uh, topics which uh, the student can never master. There will be something which you will not know and examiner will ask you. So uh, always uh, do it in detail. Now the thing is, brachial plexus begins in the neck region, passes behind clavicle and reaches axilla. So part of brachial plexus is in the neck, part of it is behind the clavicle, part of it is in the axilla. What is in the neck region? Roots and trunks, roots and trunks. So in the axilla, if you say, will be the further part, but brachial plexus begins in the neck region. So roots, you can say, when you are talking about the roots and the trunks, they will be actually in the neck region. So, which roots? Brachial plexus has five roots starting with number five, the C5. So, brachial plexus has five roots starting with five, the C5. Where is C5? You can see the C5 root value, C6, 7, 8 and T1. So, the roots of brachial plexus, five roots starting with five, the C5, cervical five, six, seven, eight and T1. They are in the neck region. And then, you will see in the neck region you have trunks also, upper trunk, middle trunk, lower trunk upper, middle, lower. They are also called superior, middle, inferior trunk. So where are the trunks? You can see them in red color and as you are showing them in red color, this is the upper trunk, this is the middle trunk and this is the lower trunk. As you see, trunks are given here, roots are given here. So where is this upper, middle and lower trunk? Upper, middle, lower trunk is in the neck region. If upper trunk is damaged, we can have Arch palsy, problem of C56, if it is lower trunk injury, clump case palsy, problem of C8 T1. If it is upper trunk injury, it is Arp's palsy, problem of C5 C6 root. And if it is the lower trunk injury, clump case palsy, then C8 T1 is, is compromised. And middle trunk has middle root value. Middle trunk has middle root value. What is this middle trunk has middle root value? That middle value is C7. It is in the middle trunk. So middle trunk has middle root value and uh, upper trunk, lower trunk injuries are common. Now, whatever the root values are, they are also the root values of the skin in the upper limb and muscles in the upper limb, dermatome and myotome. Myotome are easy to remember because proximal root value, proximal muscles, distal root value, distal muscle. So what is the proximal muscle? If you are talking about the proximal muscle, say shoulder muscles are proximal muscles. So they will have C5, 6 root value. The scapular muscles, the arm muscles. So shoulder, arm and scapular muscles. Proximal muscles, proximal root value, C5, 6 will be compromised in Arp's palsy. And distal muscles, distal muscles are hand muscles, C8, T1, they'll be compromised in clump case palsy. So distal muscles are, C8, T1, and they are hand muscles like lumbrical interosseae. Lumbrical interosseae will be compromised in the clump case palsy, leading to claw hand deformity, claw hand deformity. So you are telling proximal root value will supply proximal myotome. Yes, proximal myotome, shoulder muscle, arm muscle, and the scapular muscles. They are compromised in the Arp's palsy, leading to policeman tip hand deformity. Policeman tip hand deformity, which we'll be looking at a diagram. And uh, what about the lower trunk injury in the neck region? If there is lower trunk injury, which can happen in hyperabduction injury, hyperabduction injury is lower trunk injury. So lower trunk hyperabduction injury, C8 T1 will be compromised. What is C8 T1? C8 T1 is the root value of the distal muscles. Distal root value, distal muscles, hand muscles. C8 T1, if I ask you, give me one value, then T1 is better answer. Then T1 is better answer. So C8 T1 is good, but T1 is still better answer than C8. And they'll be uh, supplying lumbrical interosseae. What will happen in clump case palsy? 
CAT1 compromise. So, which muscles will be compromised? Lumbrica and trochea. So, which deformity will come? Claw hand deformity. Why the claw hand deformity will come? That we'll discuss. But, because T1 is compromised, there can be Horner syndrome also. T1 is injured Horner syndrome also. In some case, palsy, there can be Horner syndrome and you know, the superior tarsal muscle is paralyzed. Tosis, partial tosis. And the later pupil is compromised. Then, meiosis. Tosis and meiosis, feature of Horner syndrome. In some case palsy, when there is injury of T1, there will be features of Horner syndrome, which is superior tarsal muscle Miller compromise, partial tosis, dilator pupillae supplied by T1 sympathetic compromised. So, so meiosis, tosis meiosis can be a feature of the some case palsy. All of these are MCQs. As you proceed further with the details you will notice that, and these are very frequent questions and asked in different ways, multiple times. So as I was telling, if it is the root value of shoulder muscles or scapular muscles or arm muscles, it is C56 and they are like deltoid muscle for shoulder abduction, C5. Deltoid muscle for shoulder abduction, C5. So it will be compromised in Arb's palsy. And, uh, there'll be a problem of abduction. So deformity means there'll be A double D. Adductors become more powerful. If adductors or gravity become more powerful, then the arm will remain in A double D adduction. There'll be a palsy problem. In our palsy, there is also a problem of six. So you see, when you are doing elbow flexion, you read C6. You need C6. This biceps brachii, brachialis, they help in elbow flexion then you need C56. What is the root value of biceps reflex? Root value of biceps reflex is C56, compromise in Aos palsy. So biceps reflex is lost in Aos palsy? Yes. So if the C56 is not working, then which one will be more powerful? Seven, which is triceps. Triceps reflex seven. So triceps will be more powerful. What will be the deformity? If biceps is paralyzed, triceps is more powerful, extension deformity. In the patient, there'll be extension deformity. And where is the patient? You can see your patient here. This is the patient, the policeman tip hand deformity. Now, if it is the policeman tip hand deformity, what is the problem here? It is injury of C56. It is of palsy and it is Problem of proximal muscles. Proximal muscles like shoulder muscles, scapular muscles. Can you name some shoulder scapular muscles which were compromised? Yes, like deltoid, which is for abduction. So deltoid for abduction, okay. Which other muscle was compromised? Scapular muscles like teres minor. What is the root value of teres minor? Root value of teres minor or deltoid is same, C56, they are compromised. Okay, so what is the purpose of teres minor? Lateral rotation, which is not possible. Now, if lateral rotation is not possible, if abduction is not possible, then what the bis muscle will become more powerful. A double D adductors and medial rotators. That is why deformity is A double D adduction and medial rotation. Why there is A double D adduction, medial rotation? Because these muscles became more powerful. Why they became more powerful? Because the abductors and lateral rotators are compromised with the root value C56. Okay, why there is elbow extension deformity? There is elbow extension deformity because the flexure, C56, biceps is not working, brachialis is not working. So then which muscle became more powerful? Triceps, T7 became more powerful. The elbow is in extension because triceps is more powerful because biceps is paralyzed. Biceps reflex lost. Okay, so why the forearm is in pronation? The forearm is in pronation because it is understood Biceps is a powerful supinator. Biceps is a powerful supinator. If the powerful supinator is not working, pronators become more powerful. Which pronators became more powerful? The pronators which are in the forearm, their names are pronator teres and uh, pronator quadratus. So pronator teres, pronator quadratus still working. Yes. So pronator teres, pronator quadratus still working. Pronators became more powerful. That is why the arm will remain in pronation. This is called as policeman tip hand deformity. Arbs palsy. Then what about the clump case palsy? How do you explain the claw hand deformity? That we will do, but remember one thing, that when we talk about clump case, the root value 
of the hand muscles like lumbricle interosseae is C8 and T1. Especially when you talk about the finger flexion. If you are talking about finger flexion, it is C8. And, and if you are talking about spread the finger, close the finger. Spread the finger means dab. Bring them back, pad. So what is this pad and dab? If you are talking about palmar interosseae adduction, dorsal interosseae abduction, pad and dab. So palmar interosseae, dorsal interosseae, who is supplying? All interosseae are supplied by deep branch of ulnar nerve. If they are supplied by deep branch of ulnar nerve, what is the root value? C8, T1. C8, T1. If you want specific, T1. If you want specific, T1. When you spread the finger, dorsal interosseae for abduction. And when you close the finger, add the finger, add the finger, adduction, add the finger, adduction, pad, palmar interosseae. So palmar interosseae for adding, dorsal interosseae for abducting or, what is abduction? Somebody has abducted, opharan, dur le jana, spread away. So who is doing abduction? Dorsal interosseae. But palmar dorsal interosseae, all eight interosseae are supplied by ulnar nerve. Root value C8 T1, more specific T1. So in some case palsy, which root value is compromised? C8 T1. If I want only one answer, if you want only one answer, better answer is always T1. And that is why we say Horner syndrome is T1. See, some points I'll specify. And why I specify? Because examiner is asking, that is why. So you should be careful about all that. So what will happen if uh, uh, these muscles are not working? Claw hand deformity, in clump case palsy. But how do you explain claw hand deformity? That will do, but at this moment, you proceed further and talk about the dermatome disturbance. What will be the sensory loss in our palsy? What will be the sensory loss in clump case palsy? So sensory loss in our palsy will be C56 dermatome. Yes, where is it? The sensory loss in clump case palsy will be C81. Yes, where it is? And this diagram we have taken from Harrison Medicine and the edition is 21st edition. The latest, always read from latest editions because uh, uh, there can be changes and whatever the change is there is the question. So whatever changes becomes a question, examiner will always be interested in asking the updated information. Always read from latest books, like in BD Chirashya, if you have read BD Chirashya edition 4 in your first MBBS, you cannot depend upon that book right now because now it is, I think, 8th edition or 9th edition has come in BD Russia, and uh, things keep changing. So it is always advice for competitive exams, for competitive exams, for competitive exams always read from the latest editions and uh, that is advice. So we have taken this diagram from Harrison Medicine. Why Harrison? Why not? Uh, Gray's Anatomy, because Gray's Anatomy, for Dermatome, there are three diagrams and there are variations. So I cannot use uh, three diagrams because that will confuse you. So it is better to use Harrison Medicine if our purpose is solved. So what is your purpose? Purpose is, I told you there are five root values uh, for brachial plexus. So distribute those five root values in the upper limb. Brachial plexus supply upper limb, start with number five, C5. Where is C5? C5 is lateral and C6 is lateral and then C7 the middle three fingers middle three fingers C7 and C8 is little finger T1 is the medial elbow so outside to inside outside to inside repeat again where is C5 C5 is the lateral side of the arm like lateral elbow so lateral um, lateral elbow, yes, C5. Then where is C6? The thumb. C6 is the thumb. So C6 is the thumb. Then where is C7? Middle three fingers, middle root value. Middle three fingers, middle root value. Middle root value of what? Brachial plexus has five root value. What is the middle value? C7. C7 for middle three fingers. Middle fingers, C7. So you can show them here. This is C7 for the middle three fingers, anteriorly or posteriorly? Not only anteriorly, but also posteriorly. Not only anteriorly, but also posteriorly. So don't uh, bother because maybe anterior posterior is C7. What is thumb again? 
thumb was proximal C6. If thumb is proximal, which is C6, you see here, this is C6, this is thumb. Okay, then what is little finger? The thumb is proximal C6 and uh, little finger distal T1. Now, when you say it is little finger distal the T1, this is the little finger, which is C8. C8 is also shown here on the anterior side, posterior side, it will be C8 only. What is the purpose of uh, discussing that? C in Arms palsy, the sensory loss will be lateral side of the upper limb, C5, C6, including the thumb. And in clump case palsy, the sensory loss will be medial side of the upper limb, including the little finger. Little finger, C8, middle elbow, T1. C8, T1. So in clump case palsy, little finger, middle elbow, sensory loss. In Arms palsy, the lateral elbow, and the thumb will be involved. Okay, that is about the dermatomes, upper limb. What about this question which came? They were asking about this nerve, which is musculocutaneous nerve. Now, if you are talking about musculocutaneous nerve, if you are talking about musculocutaneous nerve, the name tells muscles and skin, muscles and skin. So, which muscle and which skin? It is supplying three muscles in the arm, anterior arm. So, what are the three muscles in the anterior arm it will be supplying? And where is it coming from? In brachial plexus. In brachial plexus, we told roots and trunks are in the neck region. What is there in the axilla? There you have cords and branches. Cords and branches. There are three cords, lateral, Medial and posterior cords. So in the axilla you have cords and branches. Which cords? Lateral, medial and posterior cords. You can show them here. This is lateral cord of brachial plexus, the posterior cord and medial cord of brachial plexus. In the axilla. In the axilla, here. In the axilla. So in the axilla you have three cords of brachial plexus. Which one will give you musculocutaneous nerve? Musculocutaneous nerve is coming from lateral cord. So as you will see, lateral cord will continue as the musculocutaneous nerve, supplying three muscles, namely the coracobrachialis, biceps, and brachialis. Coracobrachialis, biceps brachii, and brachialis, anterior arm muscle. In the anterior arm, you have three muscles for elbow flexion. Actually, coracobrachialis work for shoulder flexion because it is at the shoulder level. But these two muscles will do elbow flexion. I'll repeat again. There's a question on musculocutaneous nerve. The name is musculocutaneous. It will supply muscle and skin. First, the muscles. It will supply three muscles in the anterior arm. What are the three muscles in the anterior arm it is supplying? It is supplying coracoid process humerus, coracohumerus muscle, and biceps brachii, and brachialis. And uh, what is this uh, coracobrachialis doing? Coracobrachialis, coracobrachialis is for shoulder flexion. And what about the biceps and brachialis? Elbow flexion. What is the root value? Root value you already know. C56. We were telling that this nerve can be compromised in Arms palsy because it has root value C56. Biceps, what is the root value? What is the root value of biceps reflex? C56. So, if this nerve is compromised, that was a question, where will be the sensory loss? Where will be the sensory loss? And this nerve is a continuation of, this nerve is a continuation of lateral cord of brachial plexus. Lateral cord of brachial plexus continue as musculocutaneous nerve, supply the three muscles in the anterior arm and skin, lateral forearm. It becomes, continues as lateral cutaneous nerve of forearm. Lateral cutaneous nerve of forearm. If you say it will continue as lateral cutaneous nerve of forearm, where it will supply? Lateral cutaneous nerve of forearm. So, what if the nerve is damaged? If the nerve is damaged, there will be a problem in shoulder flexion and elbow flexion. Plus, sensory loss on the lateral aspect of forearm. What is this uh, dermatome? Dermatome, I already told you. C5, C6. C5, C6. So, C6, yes. It will continue till the thumb, but thumb has different sensory nerve. This nerve do not supply the thumb. Musculocutaneous nerve do not supply thumb. Okay, so what about the other cords? You can remember a mnemonic for posterior cord. And for posterior cord, the mnemonic which you remember is, say, stars. 
So when you say posterior cord, your mnemonic is stars. What are the five branches you are talking about? In the posterior cord of brachial plexus, you can have five branches. There is upper S and lower S. And what is this uh, upper S and lower S? There is upper S and lower S. Yeah, but what is this upper S and lower S? Upper subscapular nerve, lower subscapular nerve, supplying subscapular muscle. So upper subscapular nerve, lower subscapular nerve, coming from posterior cord, supplying subscapular muscle. What is this T for? T is thoracodorsal nerve, supplying a muscle in the thoracodorsal region, latissimus dorsi, dorsum of the thorax. So T is thoracodorsal nerve, supplying a muscle in the dorsal thorax, which is latissimus dorsi. Okay, then what is A? A, you can see here, this nerve, which uh, you can show here as well. It will be going around the surgical neck of humerus in the axilla and hence called as axillary nerve. So A for axillary nerve, and uh, it is a nerve which is on the surgical neck of humerus. If there is a fracture, surgical neck of humerus, then this nerve will be compromised. Two muscles will be compromised. And uh, which two muscles supplied by axillary nerve? It is the deltoid and teres minor. You remember they were compromised in Arb's palsy also. So in the posterior cord stars, the A is axillary nerve, and axillary nerve is supplying two muscles, deltoid and teres minor. What is deltoid for? Deltoid is powerful abductor. And what is teres minor for? Teres minor is a lateral rotator, lateral rotator. So axillary nerve is a branch of posterior cord. If compromised, there'll be problem with abduction and lateral rotation. And sensory loss, sensory loss, C5 dermato, C5 dermato. Okay, what about this R? R is radial nerve. R is the radial nerve, and radial nerve is the nerve of extension. Radial nerve is the nerve of extension. So as you are going to follow the radial nerve, radial nerve will supply extensor muscles like triceps or extensor muscles of the fingers. Here it is extension of the elbow, triceps, and extensor of the fingers like extensor digitorum, extensor pollicis extensor digitorum, extensor pollicis, these muscles uh, are extensor of the carpus, wrist, extensor of the carpus. They're all supplied by branches of radial nerve. Posterior cord. What about the medial cord? Medial cord continues as the ulnar nerve. Medial cord will continue as the ulnar nerve. So what is the root value of uh, ulnar nerve if it is continuation of medial cord? Ulnar nerve is a continuation of middle cord, and we already know the ulnar nerve supply the hand muscles, so C8, T1. C8, T1. C8, T1 is the root value of ulnar nerve. The middle cord in the brachial plexus will continue as ulnar nerve, passing behind the middle epicondyle, passes behind the middle epicondyle, and then it will be mostly supplying the hand muscles, like lumbrical interosseae. Compromised in clump case palsy. So that is about the ulnar nerve. Now, why I am focusing upon all those things? Because you are getting questions like this. And multiple times. They'll give you some points, A, B, C, D. They'll be giving you some points like, uh, they will tell that uh, there is a nerve which is damaged at this level. Point A or point B or point C a point D, and you can see which nerves they are talking about. If it is surgical neck of humerus, there is a fracture, then it will be axillary nerve. If it is mid shaft humerus, fracture mid shaft humerus, a nerve passes behind humerus in the mid shaft. The nerve which passes behind the humerus in mid shaft supplying muscles like triceps is radial nerve. So you are talking about radial nerve behind humerus. And what if there's a fracture lateral epicondyle? A fracture lateral epicondyle, a radial nerve only. Fracture lateral epicondyle, that same radial nerve, because it passes in front of the lateral epicondyle, becoming a content of cubital fossa. So radial nerve become a content of cubital fossa. 
in front of lateral epicondyle and uh, that can be damaged. Or what is this nerve behind medial epicondyle? The nerve which is behind medial epicondyle is ulnar nerve and it is not a content of cuboidal fossa. It is not a content of cuboidal fossa. Then which nerve is a content of cuboidal fossa? It is radial nerve. When it will give two branches, motor and sensory. So in front of the lateral epicondyle, in front of the lateral epicondyle, you will have radial nerve giving two branches, the motor and sensory. But radial nerve is a content of cuboidal fossa, which is in front of elbow joint. Why ulnar nerve is not a content of cuboidal fossa? Because ulnar nerve passes behind medial epicondyle and cuboidal fossa is in front of the elbow joint, not behind. What will happen if there's a fractured medial epicondyle? If there's a fractured medial epicondyle, the nerve damages ulnar nerve and uh, leading to hand muscle palsy, claw hand deformity, again, claw hand deformity. With that information, with us, you can move further and uh, as you do so, tell me in the chat that which nerve injury is A, which nerve injury is B, which nerve injury is C. And I know you can answer, but then I will ask you the details also. Tell me. Tell me A, B, C, which nerves are injured? Okay. C is wrist drop. Okay. But not medial now, radial now. C is wrist drop but radial now. AMR. What is AMR? Alnar, median, radial. Okay, fine. Let us go into details. See, the point is, examiner gives you a diagram or a patient, photograph of a patient, and you might be confused between the alnar claw hand and radial claw hand. You might be confused between alnar claw hand and median claw hand. This is hand of benediction. This is hand of benediction, but it appears like this is also hand of benediction. How will you differentiate? This and this, both of them, they appear like hand of benediction. How do you differentiate? How do you know that this is ulnar claw hand, this is median claw hand? That is wrist drop, no problem. Because radial nerve is not working, you will have the extension of wrist not working and there will be a loss of wrist extension. Wrist drop, no problem. Radial nerve injury, wrist drop, no problem. But can you tell me is this a na claw hand or is this median claw hand? Is this, of course it is a na claw hand because you are seeing the, the medial fingers compromised, but it appears like median, what is called as the hand of benediction. See, simple thing. If the examiner is talking about median nerve and hand of benediction, he will always start with in the question it will written you ask the patient to make a fist and this happened you have asked the patient to make a fist and this happened then it is hand of benediction but this will be permanent this will be permanent you ask the patient to make a fist or don't ask a patient to make a fist it will always be there and this is ulnar claw hand so ulnar claw hand persist all the time despite the fact whether you make a fist or not. But median claw hand may not be that evident. As you ask the patient to make a fist, it will become evident. So this is one difference. In the exam, in the question, they will be right. When you made the, when you made the patient to make a fist, then this happened. Then median claw hand, hand of benediction. One more difference. If it is a na claw hand, you will find MCP joint will be in hyper extension, hyper extension, metacarpophalangeal joint, metacarpophalangeal joint 
will be in hyper extension hyper extension al narc law hand mcp joint will be in hyper extension that you will not see in median nerve you will see that this mcp joint is in flexion it is in flexion there is no hyper extension at the mcp joint so this is two differences just by looking at the patient you can tell this is median nerve injury this is al nal nerve injury i'll go into more details now as you are trying because i have seen that students uh, making mistakes in identifying the two see this is in church the priest will bless the couple two people getting married bless the couple hand of benediction you are blessing and from there we get the name hand of benediction hand of benediction plus if it is median nerve injury of course three and a half fingers including nail beds will have sensory loss so if it is median nerve injury you will have sensory loss on three and a half fingers laterally including the nail beds because nail beds are also supplied by the median nerve so that will confirm that it is a median nerve injury and why there is a a problem when the patient is trying to make a fist say this is some nerve injury at a higher level median nerve injury now when there is a median nerve injury at a higher level there is a muscle here which is flexor distorsion profundus lateral half paralyzed because lateral half of flexor distorsion profundus which is folding these fingers will be paralyzed so median nerve injury somewhere at a higher level there is paralysis of lateral half of flexor distal profundus which is working for folding these fingers plus there is paralysis of flexor pollicis longus because flexor pollicis longus which fold the thumb is also supplied by branch of median nerve since median nerve is injured the branch which is called anterior interosseous nerve the nerve of deep nerve of anterior arm so median nerve gives you anterior interosseous nerve and that anterior interosseous nerve supplies some muscles like flexor pollicis longus or lateral half of fdp they are not working that is why when you are asking the patient to make a fist when you are asking this patient to make a fist you will see that these three fingers cannot fold because flexor pollicis longus is not working and lateral half of fdp not working so they will not fold these two will fold because that is controlled by ulnar nerve the middle half of flexor distal profundus the middle half of flexor distal profundus is still working because it is controlled by ulnar nerve so in this case how these two fingers could fold because fdp middle half controlled by ulnar nerve still working but these fingers could not fold because lateral half of fdp is not working this finger could not fold the thumb because flexor pollicis longus is not working that is why there is hand of benediction so whenever the examiner will give you a diagram like that you have to identify it by the fact that they will tell i asked the patient to make a fist and this happened that is the statement they will begin with and then you know why it happens okay this is median nerve what about the ulnar nerve ulnar nerve you have to remember one thing ulnar nerve is supplying one and a half muscle in the anterior forearm and most of the muscle in the hand so which one and a half muscle in the anterior forearm it is supplying and which muscles in the hand it is supplying you can see here already we have discussed one of that so you can see that ulnar nerve supply the medial half of flexor distal profundus which was folding these two fingers finger 4 5 finger 4 5 if you want to fold you can use the middle half of fdp supplied by ulnar nerve so you are telling that ulnar nerve will supply most of the muscles in the hand and one and a half muscle in the anterior forearm you have told half muscle which one muscle there's a muscle on the ulnar side flex the carpus from ulnar side there's a muscle on the ulnar side flex the carpus from ulnar side flexor carpus ulnaris carpus is wrist so flexor carpus ulnaris so flexor carpus ulnaris one and this is half muscle one and a half muscle supplied by the ulnar nerve 
Otherwise, all the anterior forearm muscles are supplied by median nerve. Rest all the anterior forearm muscles are supplied by median nerve. So can you name some nerve muscles which are supplied by median nerve? Yeah, whatever is left. Yeah, but what is left? Whichever muscles in the anterior forearm, like we had just told, lateral half of FDP, folding these fingers. So median nerve will supply lateral half of FDP. Yes, it will supply all the FDS, flexor distorum superficialis. It'll supply flexor pollicis longus. Flexor pollicis longus. It'll supply pronator teres. This is sorry, pronator teres and pronator quadratus. Both the pronators in the anterior forearm. So you're telling anterior forearm muscles only two nerves are supplying. Yes, ulnar and median. If you know what ulnar is supplying, rest all supplied by median nerve. So what is ulnar supplying? One and a half. What is one and a half? Flexor carpus ulnaris and flexor distal profundus but only middle half. So rest all. Lateral half of FDP, flexor distorum superficial, the flexor pollicis longus or pronator, both the pronators, pronator teres, pronator quadratus, they'll be supplied by median nerve. Okay, what about the hand? In hand, deep. Okay, one more thing. The flexor distorum profundus give you lumbricals also, lumbricals. So flexor distorum profundus, the tendon will give you lumbricals. Like flexor distorum profundus for these fingers will give these lumbricals. Lumbrical for the finger here. And you can see lumbrical for the finger 4, 5 is given by the FDP. So supplied by ulnar nerve. These lumbricals will be supplied by ulnar nerve. Then what about the FDP of these fingers? FDP of these fingers were supplied by median nerve. So median nerve will supply these lumbricals. Since the FDP, flexor distal profundus, gave lumbricals, and since the lateral half of FDP was supplied by median nerve, the lumbrical 1 and 2 will be supplied by median nerve. So lumbricals 1 and 2 supplied by median nerve, lumbrical 3, 4 supplied by ulnar nerve, because these lumbricals come from FDP. FDP is a hybrid muscle, more than one motor supply. FDP is a hybrid muscle, the muscle which will have more than one motor supply. It has two motor supply. Okay, what about the interossei? Interossei are interossei between bones. Very deep. So deep branch of ulnar nerve. It is deep branch of ulnar nerve, maybe four palmar interossei or four dorsal interossei. So palmar or dorsal, eight interossei, all supplied by the ulnar nerve. Total eight interossei and two lumbricals supplied by ulnar nerve. What else ulnar nerve supply? Ulnar nerve will supply all the muscles which is towards the ulnar bone. And which muscles are towards the ulnar bone? Ulnar nerve, ulnar bone, hypothenar muscle, muscles of this digiti minimi, hypothenar muscles. So hypothenar muscles, digiti minimi muscles will be supplied by ulnar nerve. Yes. You will see which are muscles are hypothenar muscles will be supplied by ulnar nerve. And what else it is supplying? Does it supply thenar muscle? No. Not as such, because this area is under median nerve, but still it can supply a deep muscle of thumb. Name is A double D adductor pollicis. So A double D adductor pollicis. Questions keep coming on that, like ferment test, ferment test book test adductor pollicis in anesthesia. A question will come. Nerve conduction study for A double D adductor pollicis. First of all, you should know adductor pollicis is working on the thumb but not a thinner muscle. Point one. Adductor pollicis muscle is working on thumb for A double D adduction but not a thinner muscle. It is not a thinner muscle. It is not supplied by median nerve. It is supplied by deep branch of ulnar nerve. It is supplied by deep branch of ulnar nerve. When you do from and test, you are checking for ulnar nerve. So this is all supplied by ulnar nerve. Then what is median nerve supplying? Median nerve supply thenar muscles. One you should always remember. The one which you are, you know, testing, pen test, anterior abduction of thumb, abductor pollicis brevis, abductor pollicis brevis, pen test, median nerve, purely supplied by median nerve, thenar muscle, 
abductor for anterior abduction, pen test. So pen test is for median nerve. Yes, it is. As you are proceeding further, some diagrams for sensory supply, you should remember this, that the fingers, three and a half fingers, as we already have discussed, hand of benediction also, three and a half fingers are supplied by median nerve and till the nail beds, till the nail beds. So nail beds also or distal phalanx, distal phalanx. So distal phalanx dorsally, distal phalanx dorsally. Otherwise, three and a half fingers on the dorsal side, especially the dorsal first web space is under radial nerve, radial nerve. So which nerve will supply the three and a half fingers on the dorsum? The radial nerve will supply three and a half finger on the dorsum minus the nail bed minus the nail bed because nail bed is already supplied by the anterior nerve, median nerve. Now three and a half dorsal or ventral you have discussed. What about the one and a half? One and a half skin medially, maybe anterior or posterior is ulnar nerve. This one and a half skin, maybe anterior or posterior, anterior or posterior is ulnar nerve. So as you can see, maybe you are talking about the nail bed area, or maybe you are talking about the anterior area, one and a half is by ulnar nerve, just a kind of a revision. Now, sometimes some books will tell, radial nerve supply two and a half, and ulnar nerve supply two and a half, fingers on dorsum. I agree, but that is not your first answer. So some books will say, radial nerve will supply two and a half, ulnar nerve will supply two and a half, fingers on dorsum of the hand. I agree, it's a variation, but first answer should be three and a half, one and a half. If three and a half, one and a half radial ulnar is not in the option, then you may say two and a half, two and a half. It's a variation, it may happen in some people, but it is not in me at least, because I have felt that while sleeping, when you are sleeping, at least, you know, when you sleep only three hours per day, you will sleep in a posture and you will keep sleeping and you wake up and there is, tingling. And I have felt many times tingling. Uh, maybe I have carpal tunnel syndrome, I don't know. <laughs> but both hands it feels. And I can quickly, immediately, as, uh, as an anatomist, and I can understand three and a half finger median nerve. Sometime I feel the same for ulnar nerve. And immediately I'll do this. What you say, tinnel test or, you know, from test and all that. And I can very well I have witnessed that ulnar nerve supply only one and a half fingers, in me at least. So who was supplying this? Dorsally, radial nerve. So most of the people, this is the pattern. Two and a half, two and a half may be there. In some people, I was just trying to check myself, am I two and a half, two and a half? But I am not two and a half, two and a half. I am three and a half and one and a half. On the anterior side, of course, and on the posterior side also. Again, a question. These are all MCQs actually, so we should be careful. Now, moving further, these diagrams, I really doubt now they will be asking these questions, which are cadaveric questions. This INICD people started asking cadaveric questions, then uh, NEAT PG people followed it. Then uh, in this NEAT PG, not many cadaveric questions. And in this INICD, I don't think any cadaveric questions will come. Now you will ask me, Sir, how do you know that there will not be much of cadaveric questions in the coming INICT? Because it was not there in NEET PG. So what is the relation in NEET PG INICT? It's a complicated thing. This is what you call sixth sense. Your inner self or whatever you can, your hard work, your practice, your instinct or whatever you call it. But I doubt that they'll be asking you cadaveric questions. I have a very solid reason for that. See, genuinely, you should not ask cadaveric questions in such exams, which are computer-based, because cadaveric questions should be asked in cadaver, in the dissection hall, where you can feel it. it doesn't make sense asking you a recurrent branch of median nerve on computer screen. 
Jipper people did that once. They were asking a recurrent branch of median nerve in cadaveric dissected specimen of an what are you doing? What kind of examiner you are? Means uh, they can ask anything, of course, but I really doubt that they should. They should not ask such questions, at least. So uh, it was uh, not a good feeling to see cadaveric questions coming in the exams, and maybe they'll stop doing it. But I'm not very sure. Fifty percent, I, 15, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50. It will become 100 only once they don't ask any category question in the coming INCT. But I really doubt they'll ask. I have one more here. They would have asked for the last two years and students would have answered, but they have answered wrong. Now, if I ask a question and uh, most of the students answer it wrong, it is not a good question. Any question which I ask and most of the students give wrong answer, it is not a good question. And if it is not a good question, it should be deleted from the question bank. This is the rule. The rule is a question is a good question if at least some student could answer correct. At least some students could answer correct. If no student is answering correct, then it is a useless question. So I think these um, most of the students would have not have answered correctly. So they will stop asking this question. Now the examiner. INICT examiner, he is watching me on YouTube, live session. Uh, Dr. Kaushal is telling that they will not be asking questions on cadaver. Uh, let us put some cadaveric question in INCT. <laughs> but what do you think? What do you think? Those examiners, 50 year experience of an artist, they'll be watching my video on YouTube. What do you think? What is, what is the chance of them watching Dr. Kaushal, who is nobody, <laughs> on YouTube? So the point is, I really doubt that there will be any more questions on uh, cadavers now, because I really doubt people would have answered correctly. But it is 50-50. Don't take it stringently. <laughs> See what they have done recently was they have put one arrow on this muscle this muscle and they are asking you some details it's a deep muscle towards the thumb side but it is not thinar muscle and uh, this is a double d adductor pollicis so this is a double d adductor pollicis and it is not a thinar muscle because thinar muscle if you ask me then these are thinar muscles the abductor pollicis brevis this is thinar which i told you pen test for median nerve and uh, this is the other one you can show let us use the other color this is flexor pollicis brevis Flexor pollicis brevis has two heads, superficial head supplied by median nerve, deep head supplied by deep branch of ulnar nerve. It's a hybrid muscle. Abductor pollicis brevis is a purely supplied by median nerve. This is flexor, which we are looking at. Flexor pollicis brevis. It is a hybrid muscle because superficial head supplied by median nerve, deep head supplied by deep branch of ulnar nerve, and then there's a pure muscle which is a double the adductor pollicis because adductor pollicis is only supplied by ulnar nerve. So deeper muscle. So they have given some arrow mark and they were asking about this muscle. This muscle will not be very clearly seen until you remove uh, the superficial muscles. So just giving you um, an idea that maybe these questions might appear again. Can you tell me what is what are these muscles here? Let me change the color and tell me because again these are questions what is this muscle here 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 and uh, i'll give you a hint also and um, even without hint uh, you would have already actually known you already know you are well knowledge knowledgeable people in fact it is coming from this tendon, FDP tendon, 
coming from FDP tendon, flexor distorum profundus tendon. So these muscles which come from the FDP tendon and you should remember LL, LL is means uh, they come laterally, lumbricals and going laterally. So lumbrical 1, 2, 3, 4, lumbrical 1, 2, 3, 4 and they go lateral to individual respective finger. So going from lateral side, going from lateral side, going from lateral side, lateral side and they are inserting on the proximal phalanx and dorsal digital expansion. So lumbricals, they are LL, lumbricals go lateral to each individual finger and they insert on dorsal digital expansion. Let us talk more about these lumbricals now because questions keep coming. So these are the lumbricals. You should know lumbricals 1, 2 are unipinnate and lumbricals 3, 4 are bipinnate. So first of all, you should know lumbricals are four in number and they originate from the tendon of flexor distorum profundus. Flexor distorum profundus is identified by the fact that it will be inserted on distal phalanx, distal phalanx, distal phalanx, so that it can cause DIP flexion, DIP flexion. So flexor distorum profundus tendon, four in number for the four fingers, one, two, three, four and uh, insert on distal phalanx for DIP flexion and giving origin to lumbricals. You can see lumbrical 1 and 2 are unipinnate and if you are looking at the lumbrical 3 and 4, they are bipinnate. You can see this is lumbrical 1 unipinnate. This is lumbrical 2 originating from the tendon. And then this is bi, bi, bipinnate 3 and there will be a bipinnate 4 also. Now this arrow mark was there, they are asking what is the nerve supply. This arrow mark is on lumbrical 2 and the first two lumbricals come from lateral half of FDP and lateral half of FDP is supplied by median nerve. So lumbrical 1, 2 are supplied by median nerve. Since the lumbrical 1 and lumbrical 2 they come from lateral half of FDP, so they are supplied by median nerve. What about the lumbrical 4, 3 and 4? Lumbrical 3, 4, they come from medial half of FDP and accordingly they will be supplied by ulnar nerve. So this arrow mark, it will be supplied by median nerve. What is the function of lumbricals? The function of lumbricals, if you ask me, as they cross the MCP joint, they will cause MCP flexion and as they insert on dorsal digital expansion, they will cause interphalangeal extension. So MCP flexion, interphalangeal extension. That is what they do, which you can see in this diagram also. If they are not working, there will be a claw hand deformity, clump case palsy. So what is their function again? The function of lumbricals is to MCP flexion. Number one, it is doing MCP flexion. The four lumbricals, they are for MCP flexion and uh, the other one, other one, they are working for interphalangeal extension. Interphalangeal means PIP or DIP extension. But how can do, how can they do the PIP, DIP extension? Because they insert on dorsal digital expansion, which is a tendon of extensor distorum. Extensor distorum is having a modification called dorsal digital expansion and they insert there. Because they are inserting on dorsal digital expansion, they will cause PIP DIP extension. So MCP joint flexion, PIP DIP extension is a function of lumbricals. They do this. And what if I have clump case palsy injury to the lower trunk of brachial plexus? If you have clump case palsy injury to the lower trunk of brachial plexus, root value CAT1 gone. If CAT1 gone then Lumbricals are not working, so, so I cannot flex the MCP joint, it will go into extension and IP joint cannot extend, it will go into flexion. Exactly opposite is the deformity. MCP joint cannot flex, so it will go into extension deformity. It will be going into extension, hyper extension at MCP joint plus IP cannot do extension. So IP joint will be going into flexion deformity the IP joint is going into flexion deformity. 
Okay, understood. Lambda and Trochia not working, and you cannot do MCB flexion. But why MCB goes into extension? Because lumbar and Trochia normally they balance extensor flexor muscles of the forearm. Lumbar and Trochia they balance flexor extensor of the forearm. Once the lumbar and Trochia not working, these forearm muscles become more powerful. The posterior forearm muscle, like extensor distorum, cause MCP hyperextension, and anterior forearm muscle like flexor distorum will cause IP flexion. The deformity comes because of the extensor distorum becoming more powerful, causing MCP hyperextension, the posterior forearm muscle becoming more powerful, and anterior forearm muscle like FDP becoming more powerful, causing IP flexion. So flexor distorum, especially FDP, become more powerful. Normally lumbricals, they balance forearm muscles, if lumbricals are not working, forearm muscles are more powerful, and extensor distorum causes MCP hyperextension, and flexor distorum, especially flexor distorum profundus in the anterior forearm, will cause IP flexion. So this is some detail we wanted to discuss. Now in the abdomen region, some questions have come, and we want to focus upon them. What is the time? Six. So two hours over. Thorax and upper limb is done. Abdomen region. You know testis develops in the abdomen. Descend down to pelvis, then into scrotum. And in the process, formation of inguinal canal. Again, you have to understand that testis in a male develops in the abdomen, descend down into pelvis, passes through inguinal canal, and then move into scrotum. Why? Because spermatogenesis cannot take place at body temperature. It is 2 degree less required. So take it outside the body, put it in the scrotum. The spermatogenesis cannot happen at body temperature. So take the testis outside the body and that will be less 2 times, minus 2 means a difference of 2 degrees Celsius less and then keep it in the scrotum. That is why testis descends into scrotum. But when the testis is descending to scrotum, there is an inguinal canal formation and that is what we want to talk about. You will notice here, testis will be passing through the deep inguinal ring and it is also passing through superficial inguinal ring. And following the testis is spermatic cord. Spermatic cord is carrying the testicular vessels, testicular artery, testicular vein. And spermatic cord will also carry ductus deferens because ductus deferens has to take the sperm from the testis and put it into the urethra for ejaculation. So when testis came out, it was followed by spermatic cord. Spermatic cord carry the testicular artery, testicular vein. It also carry ductus deferens. And uh, which ductus deferens is to supposed to carry the sperms from testis, put it into urethra for ejaculation. This is the basics. And now, there is one description which is Triangle of pain, triangle of doom. So to discuss triangle of pain and triangle of doom, we will put some details here first. You will notice that in this diagram, abdominal aorta is shown. From the abdominal aorta, testicular artery is coming. Testicular artery is supposed to supply testis. So to supply testis, 
it will have to follow the course of testis. So it passes through deep inguinal ring, enters the inguinal canal, and then enters the testis. So abdominal aorta will give testicular artery, which has to follow the course of testis. It has to pass through deep inguinal ring, then inguinal canal, and then superficial inguinal ring, enter the testis. It becomes a content of spermatic cord and it is the testis which will form sperm. Now when the testis will form sperm, the sperms you will see will be carried by ductus deferens, will be carried by ductus deferens and uh, then ductus deferens is the content of spermatic cord. So it will follow the course of testis, superficial inguinal ring, enter the inguinal canal, deep inguinal ring, but then goes into urethra, <coughs> goes towards urethra and put the sperms into urethra. Let me zoom this area now. As I'm zooming this area, you will notice this is testicular artery, that is ductus deferens. Testicular artery coming from the abdominal aorta, coming from abdominal aorta, and ductus deferens coming from the testis. Now, as you follow them, you will notice there is a triangle of doom. There is a triangle of doom. Where is triangle of doom? This is the triangle of doom. So what are the boundaries of triangle of doom? Why it is called triangle of doom? The boundaries are laterally testicular vessels, medially ductus deferens, and base is by the peritoneal fold covering external iliac vessels. Again, triangle of doom, laparoscopic surgery, you should not put your staples or tack here, otherwise you will bleed these vessels. Which vessels? External iliac, artery and vein. They are the content of doom's triangle. What are the boundaries of doom's triangle? The boundaries of doom's triangle are laterally, testicular artery and vein. Medially, ductus deferens. What is the base? peritoneal fold covering some vessels. Which vessels? External iliac artery vein. Where is the apex? Apex is here. Yeah, what is this? This is deep inguinal ring. This is deep inguinal ring where you could see testicular vessels passing or ductus deferens passing. So that is deep inguinal ring. Yes. That is the apex. Yes. Where is the base? This. Now, this is a very simplified approach of looking at Doom's Triangle. Doom's Triangle is better seen laparoscopically, but I, this is oversimplification, but it will help you answering questions. Then there is a Triangle of Pain. Where is Triangle of Pain? Triangle of Pain, you can show <coughs> here. This is Triangle of Pain. Let us use some other color. <coughs> This is triangle of pain. Now, again, this is oversimplification. Triangle of pain does not appear like that, but oversimplification. Yeah, okay, but what are the boundaries? Testicular vessels medially and laterally there is a ligament which will be running deep and parallel to inguinal ligament. A ligament which is running deep and parallel to inguinal ligament, the name is identified by the fact it attaches to iliac bone and pubic bone like inguinal ligament. So what is the attachment of inguinal ligament? Attachment of inguinal ligament is attachment of inguinal ligament is anterior superior leg spine and pubic tubercle. It is pubic tubercle. So inguinal ligament attaches hip bone at two point anterior superior leg spine and pubic tubercle. If you remove inguinal ligament deep to that, there is iliopubic tract, iliopubic tract. So if I remove inguinal ligament, what is deep? Iliopubic tract. Why it is called iliopubic tract? Because it attaches to ilium and pubis, iliopubic tract. So what is the purpose of 
telling that purpose is triangle of pain middle boundary is the testicular vessels lateral boundary you can say or outer boundary is iliopubic tract okay then what is the apex apex is deep inguinal ring apex is deep inguinal ring then what is the base base is some peritoneal fold base is some peritoneal fold like this one yes what covering what covering two nerves which are important for us to know covering the two nerves which are important for us to know and the two nerves are let me use some color which will be distinct i don't know which one let us use white only maybe so which nerves are you talking about i am talking about two nerves they are content of the triangle of pain yeah okay which one lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh and and the femoral branch of genito femoral nerve femoral branch of genito femoral nerve genito femoral nerve so what is the importance of knowing that knowing that when i am doing laparoscopic hernia repair i should not put my tack or staples on these nerves they are triangle of pain triangle of pain bounded by ductus deferens sorry this is the testicular vessels on the inner side and iliopubic tract on the outer side base is some peritoneal fold covering these nerves and apex is deep inguinal ring and the nerves content are lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh supplying the lateral thigh and uh, femoral branch of genito femoral nerve supplying anterior medial thigh anterior medial thigh this is the nerve which carry cremaster reflex also you touch the upper medial thigh in a male testicular elevation touch the upper medial thigh in a male testicular elevation who is the sensory supply the sensory component is carried by the femoral branch of genito femoral nerve so femoral branch of genito femoral nerve supply anterior medial thigh yes skin on the roof of femoral triangle skin on the roof of femoral triangle okay if you are talking about these nerves what will happen if i have damaged them obviously your patient will come to you with meralgia paresthetica and what is that meralgia paresthetica there will be some sensory disturbance in the anterior lateral thigh because you have compromised lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh in triangle of pain while laparoscopic surgery so these questions have come very frequently they used to come around 10 years back now they have reappeared so that is why i tell you revise 5 year questions 10 year questions 15 year and 20 year because questions can resurface any time so you are telling that while doing laparoscopic surgery which is the most commonly damaged nerve is lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh and there will be meralgia paresthetica which is the second common nerve to be damaged the femoral branch of genito femoral nerve and what if i am doing open hernia surgery anterior approach if you are doing open hernia surgery anterior approach then there are other nerves which can be involved and their na names will be something like which color to use now let us use white only ilio hypogastric ilio inguinal so the nerves which can be damaged in the open hernia surgery again questions could be ilio hypogastric or ilio inguinal nerve ilio inguinal is first answer ilio hypogastric second answer but remember here there can also be damage of genital branch of genito femoral nerve genital branch here you have discussed femoral branch there it will be genital branch of genito femoral nerve so you cannot understand this very easily here that is why we will have a diagram to understand so as you can understand now i have first told you about laparoscopic surgeries and laparoscopic surgeries let us use this color laparoscopically the lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh can be involved this is the territory in laparoscopic surgeries number 1 and number 2 number 2 femoral branch of genito femoral nerve 
anteromedial thigh anteromedial thigh so lateral cutaneous the first answer femoral branch anterior femoral because they are content of triangle of pain they are content of triangle of pain but if i do anterior approach anterior open hernia surgery then then you might be damaging the ilio inguinal nerve number 1 which supply again anterior medial thigh and you can you can damage ilio hypogastric which supply supra pubic region supra pubic region or you may be damaging genital branch of genital femoral nerve genital branch of genital femoral nerve so what is genital branch of genital femoral nerve supplying a muscle named cremaster but it supplies skin also it supply a muscle named cremaster but it supplies some skin also which skin skin which is overlapping with iliointeral nerve and which is that skin overlapping with iliointeral anteromedial thigh but not only anteromedial thigh these two nerves have overlapping skin on the external genitalia also so you are telling that if it was open hernia repair the nerves can be damaged or iliointeral yes then iliohypogastric yes suprapubic skin or genital branch of genital femoral nerve yes which is supplying same territory like iliointeral yes what is that territory that is anterior medial thigh plus external genitalia so which part of external genitalia you have to understand in a male it will be the scrotum and penis anterior one third of scrotum and root of penis so root of penis and anterior one third of scrotum who is supplying this in a male the anterior one third of scrotum and root of penis is supplied by chiefly ilio inguinal nerve but additionally genital branch of genito femoral nerve so double supply what about a female in a female just change it you can say in a female it will be anterior one third of labia majora labia majora and the root of clitoris root of clitoris so in female anterior one third of labia majora majora because scrotum majora embryologically same and uh, glands and clitoris embryologically same so root of clitoris is supplied by by ilioid gland nerve and and genital branch of genital femoral nerve so what is the information here information is there is a question it was asking in open hernia surgery there was sensory disturbance at the root of penis which nerve compromised and that is why your answer was ilioid gland and if ilioid gland is not in the option then your answer will be genital branch of genital femoral nerve and uh, i have only one advice my advice is practice as many mcqs as possible and uh, one more advice though this is anatomy plus surgery and you are watching an anatomy person telling you some surgery details but it is advisable that you watch surgery people also discussing the same and if it is matching i know it is matching because i have watched surgery people also teaching i watch almost everything i read almost everything which is available so if you are asking about dr pritesh i watch his videos if you are asking about other people teaching surgery there are very good surgeons very good teachers dr raja mahindran in maro there is faculty in the means they are all very good teachers so i watch them what is the harm in watching them at least the topics which overlap and once i confirm that okay what i am talking about they are also talking about the same thing because we read the same books belly love sebastian surgery short surgery latest editions so we will tell the same thing isn't it and if it is same thing then i'll teach you otherwise you know uh, i should not encroach upon surgery territory because i am expert in anatomy but anyway it matches which is good so i hope it will help you in handling some of the questions and now we need to go to 
pelvis perineum. Time is 629. We thought we will finish in 3 hours, 4 to 7 and already 6.30, so half an hour still in hand. Let us justify that half an hour. And maybe some of the students would already would have started telling break, 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 yes, break. <laughs> you know, I have the capacity of teaching 14 hours continuously in a single day for five days continuously. We start eight in the morning and sometimes go 10 in the evening. So I have taught like that for last uh, 20 years, minus COVID. If you want to know, uh, ask your seniors, super seniors, they would have attended my classes. Speed in Chennai or Kanchivaram or in Kolkata. And there are other shoots, I don't want to take names because maybe this is not a platform where we should take names. But Dr. Vinayak is a very good friend of mine and he is a very good physician, teacher. So I took the name of Speed. So there I remember, I started 8 in the morning and I was teaching till 10 in the evening. And students are sitting there perfectly fine, writing all the notes. Even the last statement I mentioned, they wrote it. So that is the sincerity of the students, which gives us the energy. And I can teach 14 hours per day. I have seen that myself capable of that. And maybe that was a bit uh, now in the past, but uh, energy is the same. So I can, but I don't want actually, because uh, the young generation don't have the patience and they don't have the, I don't know, uh, not to discourage you, but uh, to encourage you, you should increase your stamina, basically. Okay, Dr. Urvashi is telling I attended live classes. <laughs> live classes are totally different. See, to build such stamina, you just have to be single-minded. There is no other way you make your path so narrow that there is no other way. When there is no other way, you have to do it. And uh, just think that you have license to treat, not license to kill. It will be very painful if you damage. See, what is Hippocratic Oath? What is Hippocratic Oath? If you cannot help, at least don't harm your patient. And that is not easy. It is not easy. So make your path so narrow that there is no other way out. You have to go through that path. Means distractions. Remove distractions. Focus. Focus and defocus. Defocus and focus. So and it will come with uh, age, with time, with experience. And you are all capable. I told yesterday also, God made us equal. There is no difference in among us. We are the same people. We have the same capacity. Patna, great. <laughs> yes. Okay. So uh, now, actually a question keep coming. Ischiorectal fossa, ischiorectal fossa. So to understand ischiorectal fossa, uh, let us look at one individual from the front view and talk about pelvis and perineum. So when you look from the front view, pelvis and perineum, laterally you will have the pelvic bones. These are the pelvic bones, the hip bone you can say. So lateral boundaries are hip bones on the right side, left side. The hip bone, which is if it is upper than ilium, if it is lower, pubis or ischium. So upper is ilium, this is lower, so pubis or ischium. Now looking from the front view, you have taken a coronal section. Front view, coronal section. Hip bones are shown here. And attaching to hip bone, you will have some muscles. Like one shown here, I'll change the color, is the pelvic diaphragm contributed by some muscles. 
So this is the pelvic diaphragm contributed by some muscle. And pelvic diaphragm is a pelvic viscera support. Pelvic viscera support. It supports the pelvic viscera. If you're telling it is supporting the pelvic viscera, pelvic diaphragm, what is pelvic viscera? Like urinary bladder, uterus, rectum. Urinary bladder, uterus, rectum. Most anterior is urinary bladder. Then behind that is uterus, then rectum. You support them. And this is the boundary line between pelvis and perineum. So above that is pelvis, below that is perineum. This is the boundary line. Above the pelvic diaphragm you have pelvis and below that is perineum. Now if you say above is pelvis, what is there in pelvis again? In the pelvis we have pelvic viscera. Yeah, pelvic viscera like what? Pelvic viscera like you have urinary bladder, behind that uterus, behind that rectum. Then what is in the perineum? In the perineum they open. In the perineum they open. What opens? Urinary bladder will open as urethra. So in the perineum there will be openings and the urinary bladder will open as urethra and what the uterus will open as? Vagina. And what the rectum will open as? Anal canal. So in the perineum which is the region between thighs Region between thighs, there are three openings if it is a female. If it is a female, there will be three openings. What is the most anterior opening? The urethra. What is behind that? Vagina. What is behind that? The anal canal. And they are in the perineum. Now, which muscles contribute to pelvic diaphragm? In pelvic diaphragm, there are some muscles and they continuously ask. So you can name, one of that is levator and eye muscle. One of that is levator eye muscle, which itself will have certain parts. So pelvic diaphragm is contributed by levator eye muscle. Yes. Why it is called levator eye muscle? Because if it is contracting, it will shorten and elevate the anus. Let us say this is rectum in the pelvis, anus in the perineum. This is the rectum in the anus and the rectum in the pelvis and anal opening in the perineum. So what will happen when this muscle will contract? Whenever any muscle will contract, it will shorten and it will elevate the anus. That is why the name is levator and eye muscle. It can elevate the anus. Okay, levator and eye muscle, you are telling that itself will have some certain components. Yes. Which components? Actually, it will come from the hip bone and go towards the coccyx bone. So levator and eye muscle will originate from the hip bone and go towards coccyx bone. Okay. But what are the components? Tell me the parts of hip bone. Three parts. What are the three parts of hip bone? We just mentioned upper is ilium, anterior is pubis, posterior is ischium. Yes. So superior and anterior part, tell. Superior is ilium, anterior is pubis. Yes. From there, this muscle originates. Which muscle? Levator and eye muscle will have two components. One coming from pubis, part of hip bone. Other coming from ilium, part of hip bone. And going towards the coccyx bone. So you know the name of the muscles. Or you are telling that levator and eye muscle which can elevate the anus will be taking origin from the hip bone, parts of hip bone and then inserting into coccyx. Yes, not exactly into coccyx but some fibers which are going towards coccyx, like there is something called anococcygeal raphe. Anococcygeal raphe. So means they are not attaching to coccyx. No, they are attaching to coccyx via anococcygeal raphe. So basically they are attaching to coccyx, yeah, you can say that, but not directly. Why are the anococcygeal raphe? What is this anococcygeal raphe? You know, there are opening urethra, vagina, anus, and behind the anus you have the coccyx. So, anococcyx raphe. Okay, so what are the name of the muscles in levator and eye? Two names. What are the two names? You can see yourself, pubococcygeus, iliococcygeus. So, levator and eye muscle has two components. Yes, pubococcygeus, iliococcygeus. Now, pelvic diaphragm is contributed by levator and eye muscle and one more muscle which will come from the hip bone and go to coccyx but is not a part of levator and eye muscle. So you are telling that pelvic diaphragm 
is three muscles basically. Now let me give you a detail here. What we are talking about is because continuously asked questions. These are continuously asked question. What is pelvic diaphragm? Pelvic diaphragm is three muscles coming from three parts of hip bone. What are the three parts of hip bone? They are ilium and the pubis and the ischium. So you are telling that pelvic diaphragm will be contributed by three muscles coming from three parts of hip bone. Yes. And where do they insert? They insert into coccyx. So what will be their name? The name you can tell yourself. Iliococcygeus, pubococcygeus, ischiococcygeus. What are the names? Iliococcygeus and pubococcygeus and ischiococcygeus. Remember, ischiococcygeus is simply called as coccygeus also. If a name coccygeus comes, if a name coccygeus comes, it is understood that it is a short form of iliococcygeus. Iliococcygeus. So pelvic diaphragm has three parts. Yes, coming from three parts of hip bone, moving towards coccyx bone, and iliococcygeus, pubococcygeus, ischiococcygeus. Ischiococcygeus is simply called as coccygeus. When you see the name coccygeus, it means ischiococcygeus, but it's not a part of levator ni. Now, if it is not a part of levator and eye muscle, then what, where is levator and eye muscle? I already told you, levator and eye muscle is this, iliococcygeus and pubococcygeus. So, these two are levator and eye muscle. Yes, they can elevate the anus. So, you are telling pelvic diaphragm is equal to levator and eye muscle plus ischiococcygeus muscle. Yes, that is the point. Pelvic diaphragm is levator and eye muscle plus ischiococcygeus muscle. And what is levator and eye? Levator and eye is iliococcygeus and pubococcygeus. Now, this you can show in a diagram also. And the diagram is here. You can show the same thing in a diagram. In lithotomy position, you put a female. Put the female in lithotomy position. Baby delivery, you are delivering the baby, this is the stirrups and deliver the baby, that position. So which bone will be anterior? The bone which is anterior is pubis bone and uh, which bone will be posterior? So anterior bone is pubis bone, posterior is the sacrum and coccyx bone, sacrum and coccyx bone and uh, what is this openings here in female? These openings in female, you can tell that this is uh, anterior opening urethra, this is vagina, this is anus, urethra, you can write here, this is urethra and then this is vagina and then this is the anus, okay, so urethra, vagina and anus, yes, and what is these muscles you are showing, the pelvic diaphragm and uh, which muscles are component of pelvic diaphragm? See, coming from the pubis bone, coming from pubis bone, inserting into anococcygeal raphe. This is the anococcygeal raphe. Anococcygeal raphe. Raphe means some collagen fibers where muscles are inserted. Pubococcygeus. So this is the muscle which you are telling coming from pubis and going towards the coccyx. Yes, the name is pubococcygeus. Okay, this is pubococcygeus. Then where is iliococcygeus? Iliococcygeus you can show. Here, this is iliococcygeus. Now, as you saw, show this is the iliococcygeus on this side as well as other side. These two muscles, when they are contracting, they can elevate the anus. So together they are called as levator and eye muscle. When you are talking about pubococcygeus and iliococcygeus, together they are together called as levator and eye muscle. So these two together can be called as levator and eye muscle. But if you want to have pelvic diaphragm, you should have talked about this muscle also. Which one? You can see this muscle here coming from ischium towards the coccyx. From the ischium towards the coccyx. So if this muscle is coming from ischium towards the coccyx, ischiococcygeus, yes, ischiococcygeus, which is uh, 
simply called as coccygeus. So ischiococcygeus or coccygeus, yes. Are you trying to say ischiococcygeus is not a part of levator and eye? No. Levator and eye is only these two muscles. Ischiococcygeus is not a part of levator and eye. It cannot elevate the anus. Okay. Then uh, what is it a part of? It is part of pelvic diaphragm. Pelvic diaphragm has three muscles coming from three parts of hip bone. So this gives you some orientation. Now things get deeper. Puborectalis itself, this uh, pubococcygeus itself will have three parts. So what are the three parts of pubococcygeus? A part of pubococcygeus which is going around the urethra is puboerythralis, around the vagina, pubovaginalis, and around the anus, puboanalis, or it is also called puborectalis. I'll repeat, a muscle coming from pubis going towards coccyx is pubococcygeus, and pubococcygeus itself will have three parts, going around urethra, puboerythralis, Going around vagina, pubovaginalis. Going around anus, puboanalis or puborectalis. So, what are they? They are skeletal muscles, sphincters. Hold the urine, urinary incontinence. Hold the vaginal lumen, vaginal content. Then it is a vaginal sphincter. And hold the fecal matter, fecal continence. So, you are telling puboerythralis or puboerythralis or puborectalis. They are all parts of pubococcygeus. Yes, they are parts of pubococcygeus. Are they parts of levator and eye? Levator and eye, if you say, then it should be elevating the anus. So you can say puboanalis part is definitely a part of levator and eye, but not as such. Puborethralis may not be included. So things get deeper and deeper. The more deeper you go, that's what I talk about. The more you read, the less you know. And somewhere you have to set the boundary. I cannot teach you everything. Examiner cannot ask you everything. Because examiner himself cannot know everything. Nobody can know everything in everything. You can be expert in one thing. I can be expert in anatomy, but I cannot be expert in biochemistry also. I cannot be expert you know, expert in pathology. If I start teaching biochemistry, I'm compromising on my anatomy. It is not that I cannot teach biochemistry. I can, but I will be compromising on anatomy. There are faculties who can teach many subjects. There are already existing, but I don't recommend that. At least for exams like INIC ET exam, All India PG exam. Other exams like FMGE, you can depend upon them. When I am telling that I have been teaching anatomy for last 20 years and I don't have confidence that I am teaching well, a single subject 20 years and I don't have the confidence that I am teaching well, people who have come some 10 years back and start teaching you anatomy, pathology, medicine, surgery, how, and then they will say, I am the topmost anatomy faculty in India. They will say, no, I am not telling this. I will never tell this because I will never be. So be careful about these people who are around you. Okay, so what about the Ischiorectal fossa, we were talking about, because questions keep coming on ischiorectal fossa. You have to look from posterior view, because you're talking about rectum. What is anterior? The urinary bladder. What is posterior? Rectum. So look from posterior view. Then you will talk about ischiorectal fossa. See, when you look from posterior, you can mention that this is the rectum, and this is anal canal. Rectum and anal canal. And when you look from posterior, you can see the ischium part of hip bone. Ischium part of hip bone. This is ischial tuberosity. Ischial tuberosity on either side. This is left side. This is right side. So you are looking from posterior view. Right and left ischial tuberosity. Ischial tuberosity. Ischium part of hip bone. Ischium part of hip bone. 
सिंपल इश्यो रेक्टल फोसा इश्यो रेक्टल फोसा पेरिनियम विल बी मोर एंटीरियर इश्यो रेक्टल फोसा विल बी मोर पोस्टीरियर सो इंस्टेड ऑफ राइटिंग हेयर पेरिनियम यू कैन राइट इश्यो रेक्टल फोसा सो टेल मी द बाउंड्रीज ऑफ इश्यो रेक्टल फोसा देन इश्यो रेक्टल फोसा इज ऑल्सो कॉल्ड इश्यो एनल फोसा इफ इट इज इंफीरियर so ischio rectal fossa is also called ischio anal fossa if it is inferior yes inferior it is anal superior it is rectal so you are telling that there will be one ischio rectal fossa here yes and one here yes and they communicate with each other in a horse shoe shape manner what is the importance of knowing that one ischio rectal fossa communicate with other ischio rectal fossa in horse shoe shape manner and their communication is behind the anal canal behind the anal canal behind the anal canal one ischiorectal fossa is communicating with other ischiorectal fossa if there is one abscess here and you don't take care of that there will be abscess there also so one ischiorectal abscess can become other ischiorectal abscess the pus passing behind anal canal in a ish in a horseshoe shape manner communication okay what are the boundaries boundaries this is a muscle we already know pelvic diaphragm so pelvic diaphragm or levator and i muscle this is pelvic diaphragm or levator and i muscle it'll be forming superior medial boundary superior medial boundary or roof of ischiorectal fossa so you are telling there'll be a muscle here like this yes and what about this muscle here which is laterally this muscle here which is laterally that is obturator internus attaching to ischium part of hip bone what is this muscle let us take some other color this color this color so this is the obturator internus and the uh, obturator internus attaching to ischium part of hip bone so you are telling that uh, levator ani muscle is uh, superior medial or roof of the ischiorectal fossa yes it is and laterally you have obturator internus attaching to ischium part of hip bone yes laterally obturator internus attaching to ischium bone can i show the obturator internus on the other side yes obturator internus on the other side this is obturator internus and uh, levator ani yes levator ani on the other side so two ischiorectal fossas then obturator internus will have obturator fascia and obturator fascia itself will have pudendal canal and in pudendal canal you will have pudendal nerve and pudendal nerve send a nerve to supply the anorectum i'll repeat again on the obturator internus you have obturator fascia in the obturator fascia you have pudendal canal in the pudendal canal you have pudendal nerve and pudendal nerve is supplying the rectum and anal canal this is called as inferior rectal nerve because it supply inferior rectum and anal canal is a content of ischio rectal fossa i'll repeat again i'll zoom this and maybe it will become more evident so as i'm repeating the information this is obturator internus covered by obturator fascia in which you have the pudendal canal and in the pudendal canal which is in the obturator fascia which is the lateral wall of ischiorectal fossa and from the lateral wall of ischiorectal fossa going towards medial is the inferior rectal nerve which supply not only rectum inferior rectum but it also supply the inferior anal canal inferior rectal nerve supply rectum and anal canal is a content of ischiorectal fossa it'll come from here also on the other side of course that is the other sided inferior rectal nerve you have to be careful about this nerve when you are removing the the pus and the fat 
if there is hysteroclepsis. So when there is hysteroclepsis and you will put your fingers, break the loculations and drain the pus, you should not damage this, these nerves. They carry the pain of hemorrhoids, external hemorrhoids. They carry the, carry the pain of external hemorrhoids and they are very painful. External hemorrhoids are very painful. Internal hemorrhoids are painless. External hemorrhoids are painful. So they, there is a question asking. External hemorrhoid pain is carried by? Your answer is inferior rectal nerve, branch of parietal nerve, running in the lateral wall of hysterectal fossa, in obturator fascia, covering the obturator internus muscle, attaching to the ischium part of hip bone. So this is the orientation of hysterectal fossa, which I wanted you people to have. And then let us move on to, not this, but these diagrams. Very frequently asked questions now. And uh, they are asking one detail, telling, there is a patient triple vessel disease and uh, bypass surgery to be done and great severus vein removed and sensory loss which dermato. So a patient of triple vessel disease, you want to use a bypass graft, you remove great saphenous vein. When you remove the great saphenous vein, there was sensory loss in which dermato. Great saphenous vein starts at the medial side of the dorsum of the foot, medial side of the dorsum of foot, passing anterior to medial mellulus, so great saphenous vein passes anterior to medial mellulus, which you can show here. This is medial mellulus. This is medial mellulus. So this vein, as you follow, is going behind the knee joint and then thigh and draining into a vein, which is called as the femoral vein. So the vein which you are talking about is great saphenous vein. And the nerve follows it, basically. As you follow that nerve, you can see here, if this is the great saphenous vein, which is also called long saphenous vein, the nerve is running close to it and anteriorly. And this nerve is saphenous nerve. Saphenous nerve is a branch of femoral nerve. And it will come, if you want to show, femoral nerve is here. Let me use some other color, this color. Or which color should be? Let us use black. This is femoral nerve giving saphenous nerve and saphenous nerve follows saphenous vein and it is here. Now the point is when I was removing the great saphenous vein, flush ligation, flush ligation and at this anterior to medial mellus, when I was stripping, I have damaged this nerve or maybe I, I have not damaged this nerve but due to edema because you remove a vein, there will be edema. So, edematous compression of this nerve, which dermato. Remember that saphenous nerve is a branch of femoral nerve. Femoral nerve is L234. So, femoral nerve is L234 and that will give us saphenous nerve, but only the last value, 4. So, the sensory loss will be at L4. You are telling that when you remove the great saphenous vein due to edema, there can be some sensory problem, yes. And that edema can compress saphenous nerve, which dermatome? Because saphenous nerve is a branch of femoral nerve. Femoral nerve has L234 root value. The L4 root value will come here. If L4 will come here, remember saphenous nerve supplies the medial dorsum of the foot, but never reaches the great toe. It will supply the medial mellulus, it will supply the medial dorsum of foot, but it will never reach the great toe. Now, if it will not reach the great toe, then L4 dermatome never reaches the great toe. And if L4 dermatome do not reach the great toe, then what is the dermatome of great toe? So, this is L4. Great toe is L5. And little toe is S1. S1 is sural nerve. 
Sural nerve is a branch of tibial nerve. I'll repeat again. The saphenous nerve is L4. L4 will never reach the great toe. Great toe will be L5. L5, if it is great toe, which nerve? Deep perineal nerve, superficial perineal nerve, branches of common perineal nerve. So, if it is the dorsum of the first web space, dorsum of first web space, deep perineal, most of the dorsum of the foot, superficial perineal, and superficial perineal, deep perineal, both come from common perineal. Let us draw this diagram ourselves. And as you are looking at the dorsum of the right foot, this is the midline of the body, dorsum of the right foot, right foot dorsum. This is great toe, the other toes, great toe, other toes, right dorsum of the foot. What I am telling you is, there is a nerve territory which reaches still here. This is saphenous nerve, L4 dermatome. Then you have dorsum of first web space, that is L5, deep perineal nerve. If it is, you are looking at the lateral aspect, little toe, this area, little toe, lateral aspect. Then it will be the deep, this is the sural nerve, sural nerve, branch of tibial nerve and root value is S1. A question comes, when there is a slip disc, alpha S1, when there is a slip disc, alpha S1, where is burning sensation felt? When there is alpha S1 slip disc, the root value involved is S1. Burning sensation in little toe and lateral dorsum of the foot, S1 dermatome. So S1 dermatome is little toe, and lateral dorsum of the foot supplied by sural nerve branch of tibial nerve. That is different. If it is the stripping of vein, great saphenous vein, then L4, which will be medial dorsum of the foot, but most of the dorsum of foot is actually supplied by, most of the dorsum of the foot is actually supplied by the superficial perineal nerve. Superficial perineal nerve. So where is superficial perineal nerve supplying? The superficial perineal nerve is supplying most of the dorsum of the foot. So there, that means there are four, four nerves supplying the dorsum of the foot. Yes, there are four nerves supplying dorsum of the foot. Mostly it is supplied by superficial perineal nerve. A question came, it was asking, which nerve supply medial aspect of great toe? And medial aspect of great toe is definitely supplied by superficial perineal nerve. And uh, which nerve will supply lateral aspect of great toe? If you say lateral aspect of great toe, then of course deep perineal nerve. Because deep perineal nerve supply the dorsum of the first web space. Go back to this diagram and you can see what I'm talking about. Question was, which nerve supply Medial aspect of the great toe, none other than the superficial perineal nerve. And which nerve supply the medial aspect of great toe? Great toe, it is deep perineal nerve. But root value is L5. Root value is L5. So these are some of the topics which I wanted to take care of. Though there are other topics also which we could not. But I have to stop here because cannot stretch too much. A lot of logistics involved here. Yes, I, so Kveer, I already have uh, uh, told you, medial side of great toe is the superficial perineal. Lateral side of great toe is deep perineal. Okay. <laughs> I see there is nobody writing anything in the chat or is the chat not available to my eyes or my purpose is solved. That you should be focused more upon the content than typing in the chat box. <laughs> you 
should not be typing in the chat box. You should be focusing upon the actual content. I have seen this. Uh, there is a physics wala, not the PG coaching. I don't want to put any comments like that. The tenth class, tenth class physics wala, eleventh class physics wala, because my son came to tenth class and I found that physics wala teachers are good. So I told him, watch them. They are teaching good things, like uh, trigonometry. I still remember some trigonometry. And I felt that, yes, they are teaching good. So uh, then I was just looking at the chat box. And in the chat box, it is full of whatever. This and that and this and that. So I was just wondering, these students, are they focusing upon the teacher teaching this sine theta, cos theta, Pandit, Badri, Prashad, Har Har, Bole, Cossack, and all those things? Or what are they doing? Chat, 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 the water. So anyway, uh, <laughs> new generation. So and they're good. They're all of these 10th standard students, they scored 95 percent marks, more than 95. In our era, if I could score 75 percent in 10th, I was so happy. <laughs> so uh, that 75 became 95 now. Actually, I could score more than 75, which was distinction in 10th standard, which was difficult to achieve because the, our teachers will never give us any marks. <laughs> they will deduct the marks rather than giving the marks. So anyway, generations change and uh, you people are definitely better than us. Our genes are already in you. You are better than us. You are in evolution. My son is much, much better than me, though his energies are channelized, not channelized, channelized in some other things, not in the right direction, which I think is right direction. For him, maybe that is not the right direction. So I told him, do whatever you do, but there should be no one ahead of you. You should be the expert in whichever field you choose. Become a doctor, become... NASA scientists, you become a truck driver, no issue. I'll bring a Tesla truck, drive the Tesla truck. But there would, there should not be any other Tesla truck driver in front of you. You should be the first, whatever you do. And uh, that doesn't mean that uh, I'll force him. It is a choice. I, I never force myself on anybody. I'll just give you advice and you follow it. If you wish, I don't want to force anybody. It doesn't solve the purpose. You should give choices. You should motivate, but you should not force. Because two people will be unhappy. You will be, he will be unhappy because you're forcing him. And you will be unhappy because he's not following your advice. So don't force anybody. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Adopt me. Yeah, of course, you are all adopted. You see what, what, what you are. You all students are already adopted. Why we take so much of pain? I am beyond 50 now. We take pain because you are all adopted. It is my responsibility to my students, to the society, to my country, that future doctors, surgeons, we should have dependable doctors and I will not leave any stone unturned. I will make sure that you learn, first you learn humanity, then you learn anatomy and then you learn surgery. Humanity is supreme, you know, if you cannot value human life, it's all useless. In, in then nothing matters. Answer my question, Sukhveer, 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 uh, what was your question? Uh, SAP nerve supplies medial side of leg and foot. Cephanous nerve supplies medial side of leg and foot skin till what level? Till, I told you, cephanous nerve, this is cephanous nerve. This is cephanous nerve. Till the ball of great toe. Till the ball of great toe. But great toe is not supplied by cephanous nerve. There is a mistake in Harrison medicine. Harrison medicine will show that cephanous nerve supplying the Great toe, no. Great toe is supplied by branches of common perineal, that is, social perineal and deep perineal, not by cephalus nerve. That was your question, I believe. Okay, all the best. Take care. 
and uh, bring some good happy news as soon as possible. It will be a pleasure, it is always a pleasure to see my students go beyond my capabilities. That is the best uh, gift you can give to me. Go beyond me. Then I will be happy. And the first step is get a PG seat first. <laughs> that is the beginning. And you might be thinking that INICT is such a tough exam. Tough will be once you enter the PG. That is where the real uh, toughness will begin. The hard work begins there. Maybe uh, exam is not so tough. But being a good specialist is definitely like it will take a toll upon you. But anyway, you, cho you chose to become a doctor, isn't it? It's your destiny. So work for it. All the best. God bless. Other faculty had said it supplies great to so data. No, no, no. I told you there is a uh, faculty are mistaken uh, because they follow Harrison. No. Sephiroth's nerve do not supply great to. I have read orthopedics, medicine, surgery, dermatomes, of course anatomy. No, I will not agree with that. Thank you.